subscribe for voting today. January 27th, 2024. We are live. Good afternoon. We'll call this estimates meeting to order. Uh, attendance has been noted by the clerk. Out of the chair, roll call has been taken. Thank you. Members of the committee, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest for any items on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, uh, this estimates committee is a continuation from the January 10th meeting. We have one presentation on tonight's agenda. I would now ask Maria Versace, Director of Communications, Community Engagement and Customer Service, and Matthew Arp to uh, um, please come forward and speak to the city budget process priorities survey. Please note that you have 10 minutes to present inclusive of questions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Good afternoon, Chair Martin and members of the committee. And thank you for the opportunity to provide a summary of the findings of the last three years of budget priority engagement campaigns. Um, this afternoon, I'm joined by Matthew Arp, PhD and research associate at the Laurier Institute for the Study of Public Opinion and Policy. So just to start with uh, what our objectives were going into this uh, um, multifaceted engagement campaign, as in, in years past, we wanted to provide as many opportunities as possible and make it as convenient as possible for people to provide their input about what they feel the city's budget priorities should be. Um, as we were going into this and, and planning to do engagement for this particular period, uh, we were guided by uh, the new process in which we're taking uh, in doing a multi-year budget strategy. And so consistent with that and with some guidance from my colleagues in finance, uh, we thought we would use this this period as an opportunity to do uh, a bit of a deeper dive on the trends that we've seen, the common and consistent trends that we've seen through the last three years of research, um, including the outreach that we did uh, this year in uh, December and January. So the, the campaign elements um, that are part of this overall assessment we did do uh, an updated survey on Let's Talk Brantford. Uh, we provided all of the documentation uh, with reference to the most current draft budgets. Uh, we had a, a question and answer session there, anticipating the most uh, commonly asked questions about the budget. Um, we also have a, a really informative How the City Budget Works video uh, that we showcased on the Let's Talk Brantford page. So um, our work with Laurier, the committee is well aware that uh, they've been helping us uh, up our game in terms of research, specifically as it relates to the budget campaign. Uh, they've made several recommendations to improve the methodology of the surveys that we conduct online. Um, they also introduced us to telephone sampling engagement, uh, which we conducted to inform both the 2022 and 2023 budget processes. And, uh, and through that, we're able to get random sampling of uh, residents across the city to uh, better ensure that we were getting a diverse uh, group demographically and not just those who only participate online. So the three trend analysis that will be highlighted throughout this evening's presentation focuses on the last three years of data. Um, so through 2022 to 2024, as I mentioned, we did an online survey that was hosted on our Let's Talk Brantford engagement platform. Um, for the 2024 survey, uh, 414 residents participated. Um, the total number of online participants from online surveys between 2022 and 2024 is uh, 1,808. And... Um, uh, Matt will talk about this a little bit more when he gets into the numbers, but did want to make the committee aware that when you're only looking at online survey results, you are dealing with a demographic that is somewhat skewed because you're you're looking at um, uh, 
folks that, and, and we, we saw this in the demographic data when they identified themselves, that have a higher education level um, and uh, have a, a higher uh, professional designation uh, than the general population. So that, that needs to be kept in mind when looking at the results. The telephone survey was conducted in 2021 and 2022, um, and that was conducted by the Canadian Hub for Applied and Social Research. Um, and, and we looked at those numbers in context with this year's report, again, so that we could identify uh, consistent trends as we plan for the future. So 1,000 participants uh, uh, contributed to the random telephone surveys. I'll turn it over to Matt now to get uh, into the details of the actual findings. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. Um, so moving on to the demographic overview of the sample, more than half of the respondents were college educated. The single largest group were post-secondary educated respondents. Now this is slightly over-representative from the 2021 census data in which 48, uh, a little over 48% have post-secondary education. Uh, so you can see that the sample is slightly skewed uh, in to be more educated than the census data. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the same can be said about uh, age and gender. The, the age of respondents from the sample range from 20 to 99 years old. Uh, with an average age of 51, uh, and 57% of the sample responded or identified as female. Uh, now, this is the age is slightly higher than the average age of Brantford resident, which clocks in right about 41, uh, according to the 2021 census. Uh, and this is something uh, that we'd also need to control for and take into consideration when uh, looking at these results. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as far as the location, uh, this is a, a bit of a change from last year's online sample, which was the first year that we collected ward data, uh, which it was more evenly distributed. This year, we're, we're seeing 29% of the sample are residents of Ward 2, and Ward 5, five was the least represented, but still comprised 16% uh, of all respondents. As far as the major findings go, uh, the first thing we wanted to look at was service satisfaction, the overall satisfaction uh, from respondents. And over half, 51%, were dissatisfied. Uh, now, and this is a two-point increase where 49% of respondents were dissatisfied, but somewhat consistent with the 2022 online uh, sample. Uh, so if we're looking at the three-year trend, average uh, satisfaction has varied between 5.2 and 5.5, peaking last year at 5.5. And you can see this compared to the phone sample, which was uh, slightly higher uh, the last two years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other uh, thing we wanted to look at was the value that people thought that they received for their taxes. And a majority of respondents, uh, to 58% of them, believe that they received very good or fairly good value for their taxes, which is actually a two point improvement from last year's online survey. Um, but if you look at the three year trend, uh, the average perceived overall value has actually improved slightly year over year. Um, and the, the phone data, it was, it, it started in 2022 slightly higher. Uh, and you can see last year started to come down, but for the online sample, uh, Every year, there's been some, some growth in this area. When we look at the key programming and service areas, uh, you can see that when asked, maintaining service levels were the consensus across many of these areas. Uh, there's a couple of exceptions, including the Brantford Brant paramedics, social assistance and homelessness, housing and tourism and culture, in which um, for, for, for those areas, there was an uh, appetite to increase. Uh, and for tourism culture, there is a majority uh, of, of reduction. Um, if we look at the three-year trends though, the biggest mover was Brantford Transit in which uh, you can see uh, from, the, from the, uh, the yearly data, 
2022 was closer to maintain. We've actually seen 17% growth in the number of respondents in favor of increasing funding for this area. When we're looking at the discretionary spending areas, uh, support for city parks and trails, public library, community health and wellness, and, opposite, and, and those have been strong supported. Uh, the, most of the areas you can see have strong support, whereas opposition, uh, there's strong opposition to the municipal golf course. And if we look at the three-year trend, this opposition has actually grown uh, from 2022 to 2024, there's over 12% more respondents that identified as significantly or somewhat opposing funding for the municipal golf course. Whereas Brentford Airport has actually seen a 14% increase uh, in folks that somewhat support or significantly support since 2022 to the current uh, online, online survey. When respondents were asked about increasing or adding additional new user fees, at least half of the respondents were in favor of, or I'm sorry, were opposed increasing new user fees for Brantford Transit and Lyft, whereas a majority, vast majority, supported increasing your new user fees for new development applications, parking lots, and use of roads. Um, and this is consistent with prior year's data. There's been very little movement except for a minor uptick in support for street parking fees, which has increased from 2022 to 2024 to the tune of over 7.5% uh, uh, more support in this area. Some additional highlights from the survey, half of those responded uh, supported increasing taxes slightly or significantly, and uh, respectively increasing or maintaining service levels, whereas half supported cutting services to maintain or lower tax levels. It was a near 50-50 split this year, uh, which is a slight difference from last year, where there was 51% uh, supported increasing taxes slightly or significantly. That's dropped 1%, although over half agree to spend on infrastructure now rather than deferring maintenance, which is a two-point increase from last year's survey. And the last thing we wanted to look at was there was one open-ended general feedback question uh, where respondents could basically uh, input any, any information that they wanted to, any open-ended feedback. And some of the things that came up when analyzing this open-ended feedback was uh, a significant amount of uh, opposition to additional funding for Brantford Police, on the other hand, support for additional funding for homelessness and downtown revitalization. And it was a mixed bag uh, in terms of the new support, sports and entertainment center and bike lanes. Um, and again, not completely representative uh, based on uh, the online sample, but it was interesting to kind of look at what respondents were concerned about when given an open forum. Your time is up. If you could wrap up, please. Okay, um, perfect. Um, I'd like to take your any and all questions that you may have. Sorry, we're out, we're out of time for questions. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Chair. I just uh, want to let the committee know that we covered a lot in a short period of time, and we will be providing the committee with the fulsome report. It's about 30 pages prior to the end of this uh, estimates process. So you'll get that this week. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Okay, we'll now move on to step nine, public works, uh, operating and capital budgets. Um, step nine provides a summary of budget for public works. Uh, do members wish to separate any department budgets from steps 9B1 to 9B16? Mayor Davis. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of things. I have questions about every single one of them except for golf. Uh, I prefer not to monopolize the question asking, but okay. I can tell you that uh, in respect to all the others, I do have questions and I don't know whether you want to come to me first or wait to see if someone else has any questions. Cause like I said, I don't want to monopolize the question. Well, I'd like to separate golf. So everything's separated. So can I make one other request? 
I know it's been separated between we do the current operating budget and then we then go back and look at 2025 to 2027. So oh, just maybe it makes, makes sense as we go through each department, we look at 2024 to 2027 rather than coming back and doing 2025 to 2027. How yeah, that. there's some merit to that, and this, unless there's some objection, Councilor McCurry. Chair, may I suggest that you just ask if, go through the list and ask if there's anything about nine B one, for instance, go through the whole list like we have in years past, rather than asking for separations because inevitably yeah. we are all over the place then. Yeah, but the mayor's comment was about doing B and C together. Nobody objects. We'll do that as well. Okay, Mr. Mayor, you have the floor for 9B1, Public Works Administration. Yeah, well, let me get to that spot. Okay. So we have in 2024 an increase of 8 point, no, for Public Works Administration is 41.4%. And I'm, but it doesn't really give us any detail as to why that's the case in 2024. So I'm looking for some additional information. What is it that's driving the 40% increase? To the chair, uh, to Mayor Davis. So that was a corporate reorganization. So as part of um, that process, myself and my administration is now a separate uh, business unit. We were initially combined with business support and sustainability. So you see the, the uh, decrease there and the increase in ours. So it's just basic uh, separation add plus, plus minus, sorry. So I'm sorry, where do we see the decrease? In business support and sustainability, number two. So that's a, that's a decrease in that budget, which that that's where my salary and administration was. Um, but like the other commissioners, I'm, I'm a business unit on my own now. Great, thanks. Councillor McCurry. On that item, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, so could we ask staff then to provide the side-by-side -side comparison of the cost codes that comprised the total last year and the cost codes that comprise the total this year so we can see what the actual variance is from year to year? Uh, through the chair to Councillor McCurry. I think it would probably be best if we maybe just recirculated the report that did all of this so you can see what was added and what was subtracted um, to indicate that it was uh, a net no cost. I've got way too much stuff on my desk, sorry. Uh, so that was that was a report that came out in 2023, correct? Yes, in May of 2023. Okay, so did it identify the 2024 through 27 budget numbers in that report? Uh, no, it did not. It, it dealt with the current year impact of yeah. the reorganization. So what I'm asking for is for the 20, at least not, not for the full four years, but for the 2024 budget, I, I for one would like to see uh, what, what the previous total looked like with those business units and what the current year's total is going to look like for those business units because... As, as I think we've learned in years past, we looked at uh, apples and apples year to year, and this year um, there's all sorts of fruit mixed into the mix. We can certainly put the business units to those amendments or those adjustments. Councillor Hunt. Uh, thank you, and through you um, to staff. So I understand the, the $81,000 corporate reorganization, which gives us the variance of 40 point, sorry, 41.4%, um, but the corresponding um, business unit, business support and sustainability, we're only seeing uh, just under 21%. Um, so can you just address that, Indy? The chair. Yep. So the position there is the admin, admin assistant, uh, the uh, for public works admin, and the decrease. Not only was that position and myself shifted out, but there was also another administrative group that got shifted out into public. Or sorry, operational services as part of that report.
Okay, anything further on 9B1? Seeing none. Nope. Anybody have any questions on 9B2? Mayor stepped out of the room, so we'll come back to that one. Uh, Councillor Sullivan, you want 9B3? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a question for staff. Uh, the reduction here for the diversion program is obviously that's with regards to SEMO through 26 through 27. Um, the funds that are left that are allocated to, to the budget, is that with regards to the non-eligible units? Um, through you, um, Chair, to the Councillor, uh, yes, we do have a uh, non-eligible included in there. Okay, and secondly, uh, we currently have a, a transfer from the landfill to the processing center, that which obviously will come to a cease or at least be minimized by the amount that we're collecting. Um, it, where are those reductions actually in the actual budget? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, those reductions are under waste diversion business unit. As well? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, on uh, 9B3, there's a list of budget drivers, and some of them are, are quite large, but when you look at the variance numbers and the budget above it, they don't seem to be reflected there. Someone explain why the, the numbers are so different? Um, um, to, to you, Mr. Chair, um, so is this a business by you, business a difference that uh, you want to understand? Each business unit, why the difference between very each business unit? Well, on, on page 92, the budget drivers, one of them is a $2 million uh, change transfer from Green Bin Reserve uh, to offset organics operating costs. But nowhere in the variance is there anything that's more than $150,000. Um, the explanation for that uh, is that in the same business unit, we have the reserve transfer and also the organics cost. It's all in same business unit. That's why you're not seeing the variance in the total business unit variance. Okay, so what other budget driver offsets the transfer to green bin reserve? Uh, that's the, yes, that's the um, waste collection business unit. So the green bin reserve all the money has been taken from the green bin reserve and it funds the green bin organics collection cost under waste collection business unit. Okay, but in one line it's $2 million, on another line it's 151,000. Um, to you, Chair. Um. Uh, to you, Chair Martin, uh, Sally can probably jump back in here, but I, I think um, what she's trying to explain is that the individual business unit variances maybe end up to be a small number, but there's some very large ups and downs that are happening in each of these business units that we really wanted to be transparent about when we talk about the budget drivers. So for, for an example, when you look at the budget drivers, the big reduction, which is that draw from the reserve of $2 million, that is in the waste collection business unit, but so is the increased cost of the $1.74 million for the uh, uh, curbside collection contract related to organics. So there's big ups, big okay. downs. So it's hard to just explain the 151. There's a lot going into that, and we're trying to be transparent in the budget drivers below to explain all the big things that are happening there. Yeah, no, okay, it makes sense now then if the 1.7 is included in the same line as the 2 million, we kind of offset each other. Okay. That's correct. Mayor Davis. Yeah, and the same thing, solid waste uh, through you to Selvi. So land gas, there was, I saw in both the capital budget and uh, the operating budget reference to landfill gas utilization. And it talked about drilling new wells and decreased revenue, increased revenue just exactly what's going on in respect to or will be going on in respect to landfill gas utilization next year in 2025. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair to Mayor. Um, with the, we are, um, we will be putting uh, new wells 
to in as we fill the garbage, we put new wells, or if there are existing wells, we increase the length of the well to collect the gas. So we'll be, you've seen in the capital project sheet that we will be installing new wells in the, what we call phase 3AB to collect more gas into the gas collection system. So right now we are at a break even. Our goal is to add more gas wells and collect more gas um, and generate more revenue from the landfill gas in terms of electricity generation. And the the potential increased revenue, though, has it been reflected in the budget? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, to the mayor, yes. Okay. Now, the other question I have is, uh, I think it's in 2025, and it's the waste collection jumps from 3,454,851 second line, and then 2025, it goes up almost uh, $2 million to 5640000 and generates a 16.67% increase that year. What's what's behind that? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, to the mayor, that's because of the Green Bin program. In 2024, um, like uh, Joel was explaining, there is a reserve transfer contributing, going into the same business unit that's, keep, that's showing in 2024, the waste collection has only 3.4. In 2025, there's no more reserve contribution happening. It's the total cost of waste collection, including the green bin program. That's why that big jump is shown there. And then the offset that year from us not doing the blue bin, that's right. the, the 2,323,939. Through, right, Mr. Mayor. So that's why you see a negative under waste diversion program because of the blue box program, we won't be paying anymore. Okay. And then down below in budget drivers for the four year period, it says increase in leachate charges from wastewater, 350,000. When does that, is that over four years or is that to take place in one year in particular? To you, Mr. Mayor, through the chair, um, it is for the four years. That's the total increase uh, for the leachate collection and treatment charges. And is that what we're paying to a contractor to do that, or is that an in-house cost? It is an in-house cost. Right now, um, it's costing close to $1.5 million every year to treat the leachate, uh, but the landfill pays $650,000. Uh, per year. So we are slowly increasing that contribution by landfill for the leachate treatment. So you're seeing that increase here. So just to understand, is that because the, the landfill grows larger and there's more leachate? Um, um, it's just the landfill didn't have enough money. This is one of those accounts subsidized by wastewater. Okay. And so then do we see a corresponding decrease in wastewater. Um, Mr. Mayor, that's reflected in the wastewater account. So the revenue or the charge that you're seeing in solid waste is going as revenue in wastewater account. Okay, thank you. Seeing nothing further on three, we'll go back to two. Now the mayor's back in the room. The floor is yours, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, there was one in the budget drivers that says reduce climate officer recovery from capital by 10%. So is this another one of these ins and outs or? Through the chair, Gagan Batra, manager of business support and sustainability um, to you, Mayor Davis. Uh, that decrease by 10% is to recover through the operating budget to more accurately reflect the work that that position is going to be performing. So you're shifting part of the climate officer recovery costs from capital operating. Through the chair, that's correct. Right now it's 100% capital to reflect the work being done on capital projects. However, there are some cases where work is not being done fully on the projects. There are meetings um, and other, other types of work that's operating. But still, generally, it's in reference to a capital project though, the work. 
to you, Mr. Mayor. Not always. There are things like team meetings, different employee engagement events, um, corporate events that are that are taking place, things in public work, things in our department. Um, so that 10% reflects that type of work that's happening. And also this um, staff is the liaison for SPAC as well, which is our environmental committee. Um, that's not related to a capital project. And so are we, is this the first year 2024 we're beginning to do that shift 100% capital to 90% capital? Yes, this will be the first year. Okay, and what if we decide not to do that? Leave it in capital. To the chair, to you, Mr. Mayor. So our plan is to not bring it all the way to 100% operating. It's only going to be 50%. So what we're finding is that the appropriate capital projects for this person that they are charging to have to be in place. So if we are limiting projects, there is nothing to charge. And we're not going to charge projects that they have nothing invo no involvement in. So it really is for us to do our proper uh, fiscal, uh, be fiscally responsible with this position. Okay, so through you, Chair, to uh, Joelle, do you decide to have your seal of approval as the Chief Financial Officer? Uh, through the Chair to Mayor Davis. Uh, certainly, I would support any initiative that sees the cost better directed to work that's actually being undertaken. Okay, thank you. Just a follow up to that is the intent to, to limit it to the 10%, or is it going to go up another 10% in the next year? How far is it going to go? Do the chair right now, we have 10% per year. Per year until it's 100% operating? No, it's it's going to be 10% in 24, 10% in 25, 10% um, each year. Up to the up to the 50, yeah. Up to 50%. Yes. Okay. Councillor Slasser. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the 10% the that are being um, taken out of capital, does that allow more capital to take place? Is that money going back into the capital budget? Through the chair, it just allows more money to be spent on capital costs rather than staff costs, so yes. Yeah, so the answer is yeah. yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Councilor McCurry. Chair, thank you. Um, question for the CAO. Are there any other accounts like this where we have transferred um, costs from capital to operating? There's some others you'll you'll see. Uh, you talk in, in the engineering department. Uh, they they did uh, a number of these this year as well. I wonder if we might ask. Um, for staff to undertake to provide us with a list of all items which have been uh, partially or completely transferred from capital into operating for the 2024 or subsequent year's budgets. To the chair, so just for clarification, this is the only position right now that we're transferring. There's no other transfers. However, there are other um, positions within the corporation that do charge to capital, their time to capital projects, or for example, our engineering group, mostly in our design and construction group. Um, so it's very similar to that model that we've kind of constructed in order to resource without any impacts on uh, on the operating side of things. So there are there's no other transfers happening. Um, this is the only pro. This is the only position because it's more of a corporate kind of like your uh, corporate conscience type of position rather than a full fledged project manager, similar to th uh, positions you see in engineering or environmental and other groups. So, so nothing in your what do we, everything old is new again. Do we call it a commission now? Yes, we do. So, so this year we've changed the name of commission. We've also, if I understand correctly, the way we're proceeding through budgets, uh, unlike what we've done the past decade and a half, uh, rather than basing this year's budget strictly upon what we did last year, and then having staff come to us with unmet needs and recommendations for reductions, Everything is all presented at once, including 
um, some minor new programming, some transfers here and there. Um, and now council, rather than being presented with uh, a list of things that we can choose to do or not do, uh, we have to ferret them out. Uh, is, is, am I on track there, Joelle? Uh, through the chair to Councillor McCurry, there certainly is a change in process this year, which um, was outlined through the workshops and through some of the reporting that we did with respect to developing a multi-year budget. We really couldn't do that without staff developing, uh, sort of reviewing the priorities and determining the needs um, that we were going to put into this budget, including resource requirements. But in each of these budgets, we have been very transparent about what the changes are. Um, that we have included, uh, including any of the strategic budget investments and in this particular case, the um, transfer of uh, staffing hours um, from capital to operating. Now, when help me help me make the light speed jump from last year to this year. When you say strategic, what's the remainder of the phrase? Budget investments. That was previously known as unmet needs. Uh, in general, yes. Okay. So is it possible then for staff to provide us with, I mean, sure, we've got budget drivers, but it, it doesn't really tell us the whole story. Is it possible for us to get a list of any minor new initiatives that are being undertaken as part of the base budget that we're not aware of unless we uh, read minutely all 800 pages and ask a question per page? Is there that capability? And I'm not just talking about about public works uh, in general. I'm asking if there's if there's a descriptor for these business units that tells us exactly what we're doing in addition to what we did last year. Uh, through the chair. So certainly, when it comes to um, uh, 2024 and uh, beyond, we did include in our report that came to the committee last week a summary. Um, of the strategic budget investments that were included. Uh, we did detail them out for 2024. We summarized that in a chart um, for the multi-year um, budget. No, what I'm asking if, 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 there's a, if there's a schedule that we can have a look at. You've, you've provided us with the schedule of all the new staffing positions mm -hmm. that have been included for 2024. And I believe there's about 13 of those but we don't have a summary of new initiatives, new undertakings that we're doing on a departmental basis from which we can look at that list and perhaps decide whether or not we can do without some of that in a year uh, which sees so many costs piling on the rabbit for the taxpayer at all levels. Uh, we can certainly provide um, some of the uh, service enhancements or strategic budget investments that are both um, staff and some that were highlighted, which could be just regular service enhancements uh, as well. That is something we can provide uh, in a summary to council. That would be excellent. Thank you, Joel. Seeing no further questions or comments on two, we'll jump to four. Stormwater. Mayor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just one question here. The and I think I can anticipate the answer, but it's uh, increase in internal fleet and restoration charges. This is the 2024 to 2027, 75,947. Is this another in and out or the, does this represent um, an increase in third party charges to the city? Uh, through you, the chair, to the mayor. Um, this is uh, mostly internal costs for restoration and the fleet charges. All right, and uh, similar to questions that have been asked in the last half hour, can I see uh, what the offsetting decrease is? Um, through you, Ms., uh, to the chair, to the Mr. Mayor, we've decreased the next line in the budget driver talks about repair and maintenance usage, decrease in maintenance. Those costs have been reduced. That's only 13000 whereas the increase is 75900 Um. Mr. Mayor, the this is a very small budget. The increase um, 
most of the increase here is due to the annualization um, and locate all those other charges have increased and the fleet charges are mainly due to um, the fuel cost increase and the vehicle cost increases. There's, we've reduced, the only kind of option we have is the maintenance costs and repair costs. That's the only option for us to reduce where we reduce the charges. It's a very small business unit to further reduce. So if I can, so I take it then, and it's a fairly small amount, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but so this represents an increase in the cost that you, that you expect will occur over the next four years to maintain that small fleet? Is that essentially what it is? Um, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. It is to maintain the SMUS fleet. All right. And across the budget, what assumptions has staff made? Because this, you see this kind of category in a lot of different budgets, which is an increase in the cost of maintaining and operating part of the fleet. What assumptions have staff made regarding future inflationary increases in those costs? To you, Mr. Mayor, I'll refer to fleet staff. Sorry, through the chair, Judy Moore, uh, Director of Finance to you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in our budget guidelines, we had a few different uh, areas that we proposed to staff to keep in mind for their guidelines when they were looking at their budgets. So we had a general inflation rate uh, that was 3% for 2024 and then 2% for 2025, 2026, and 2027. When it came to repair and maintenance object codes, we were seeing uh, more significant increases in those uh, so we actually had 5% as a recommended budget increase. Um, and then the fuel itself, uh, fleet had gone out uh, and they have their own sources to be able to uh, estimate what the fuel increases would be. And I can see Shane Pepper up there, so I'll let him answer to the last part. Uh, good evening, Shane Pepper, fleet manager. Um, through the chair. Um, thank you, Judy. You stole a bit of my thunder on the uh, percentage increases uh, directed by by finance. So that was a driver um, for many of the fleet budget. Um, the 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 key driver we've talked about is the increased cost of the vehicles is having the impact on the fleet overhead charges and the transfer to reserve. Um, you'll see as we get to fleet and transit that we're hoping we're expecting there will be a, f a slight savings in fuel. Um, one, the cost of fuel went down in 2023 from 2024, and we're hoping that that trend carries into 2024. And of course, our, our plan to electrify will help with our fuel budget as well. So did I understand that the, the cost of repair and the cost of replacing, you're assuming that'll be 5% per year? Uh, through the chair, Judy, my laptop is at the back. <laughs> through the chair, yes, that's correct. It was 5%. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sluss. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you as well to the fleet manager. Are, are we tracking the uh, the fuel savings as we transition to electric? Like, can you tell me what we spent last year on fuel to what we spent this year on fuel, is the percentage significant? Um, through the chair to you, Councillor, uh, we are tracking it. I do not have those exact numbers in front of me, but I can get the numbers from 2022 and 2023. Uh, there's not significant savings. Um, although we do have 14 electric vehicles now, uh, I believe 11 of the 14 were expansion vehicles. So they didn't have a, an impact on the fuel that we were using. And of course, the cost of fuel over the last couple of years increased. Um, but but I, I can we can provide those numbers. Okay. And, and I guess my second question to that is, <clears throat> when we're tracking the, the reduction in fuel, are we also tracking the increase in, in, in electricity consumption? Um, to the chair, to you, Councillor. Yes, that we are. Um, 
with with the charging program, we can pull uh, the yes, we can pull the data from the from the vehicle um, being charged. That'd be great. Just an email or something would be fine. Once you got that, that'd be perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. John Scarpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through to Selby. Uh, Selby, the annualization of the stormwater technologies from 2023, is that something we approved last year and we're just meeting the full, full complement of it being a full year this year? Through the chair, um, that's correct, Councillor Carpenter. Okay, and one more, uh, the increase in locates due to provincial regulations. What, what are these provincial regulations that have cost us an extra 26? Through the chair um, to Councillor Carpenter, um, the provincial regulation for the locates requires us to, anybody who asks for a locate, we have to locate it, uh, make the complete the locate within five days. So um, we used to do the locate, but we only met the five day requirement 55% of the time. But the province uh, uh, passed a new regulation now that requires us to um, meet the five day requirement, uh, like a 95, 99%. So due to that increase um, in the uh, number of locates, we need to meet the timeline target. Uh, the locate contract costs have gone up but we are we are meeting the target though. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So for those locates, is that something that uh, would be cheaper done in-house or is that something we're better off contracting it? Um, to, to you, Mr. Chair, we've uh, done the evaluation. Right now, it is cheaper for us to contract out. Okay, thank you. 9B5. Wastewater Services. Mr. Mayor, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, uh, some of them have been, been answered previously at the, with amounts going up in one budget and going down another. For example, the uh, increase in leachate, leachate recovery, you actually see the offset in this budget. Uh, it's actually a dollar for dollar uh, offset, so that's good to see. But there's in terms of budget drivers for the 2024 to 2027, there's reference to an increase in chemical contract costs and then an increase in electricity usage for change in chemical usage process. And that amounts to about, well, close to $400,000. So like an explanation to that so I can understand what that's about. Um, through the chair to the mayor, um, the chemical uh, contract costs, um, it's not just Brantford across North America, we're seeing chemical costs have gone up. That is due to what we are hearing that the increase in raw material costs and transportation costs. Um, what we have done is to evaluate our processes to uh, get away from chemicals and find other alternatives. Um, in our exploration, we found out that we could use ultraviolet disinfection instead of um, chlorine uh, disinfection, which would increase the electricity costs but cut down chemical costs quite a bit. Uh, so there are net savings from that kind of a change in the process. And also the good thing for us is we are we could do net metering in the future and even there is more electricity need um, at the wastewater plant, we can have a possibility of use, you know, have a supply, electricity supply there. So from all respects, it works for us to uh, move away from a chemical and add uh, ultraviolet disinfection, which adds the electricity costs in that line. Right, so if I understand what you're saying, well, if I look at the numbers, uh, the numbers you have in here, the, the cost of electricity for the UV uh, filter system, it's still going to be a twice as expensive as the reduction in chemical cost. But you're saying with the increase in the capture of gas, we hope to generate more electricity that we can use on site for something like this. Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, I'll explain a little bit further. This line, increase in chemical contract costs, uh, the 122,000 is only an increase. When we switch to ultraviolet disinfection, we would eliminate chemical. So that means it's $500,000 we spend every year for the chemical, which we don't have to spend it anymore. Instead, we'll spend, spend $250 for 
$50,000 for the electricity. So there is a net savings uh, from switching from chemical to electricity. These are one of the ways we're trying to combat chemical cost increases. All right. So, and you actually see that, I think that's reflected in the increases in 2025 and 2026, which are very nominal. And what in 2026 is a reduction. So that's that reflects that change of yes. savings. But then why in 2027 is it projected to be 13.4% increase? Um, Mr. Mayor, through the chair, that is, we are, will be debt financing a couple of major projects. Uh, the 1.3 million, Mr. Mayor, that's, right. is that the one you're uh, looking at? So the 1.3 million is the debt payment for two major projects. That's the primary clarifier and effluent pumping station. Right, and that's to to bring our landfill site up to um, much of much of what's contained within the land. The um, wastewater services is decades old. That's right. One, the primary clarifier um, is uh, 1950s, so we're replacing that with a new um, upgrading the primary clarifier. Effluent pumping station is a uh, flooding contingency. Um, in uh, flooding situations, uh, um, we are not able to discharge our effluent treated wastewater through. So by building an effluent pumping station, we could discharge effluent to the Grand River, even when the Grand River levels are high, like in the springtime or during flooding times. But shouldn't we recover that through wastewater charges? Um, um, through the chair to Mr. Mayor, yes, we are, um, but, but there are so many projects we are doing. Um, the reserve has to be balanced. If you remember the rate study we presented um, in 2021, we have to balance how what projects are funded from reserve. And uh, there are some projects had to be debt financed. So we don't have to increase our uh, wastewater rate really high. But in 2027, we that would be an option though. It would be uh, debt financed, yes. Or increase the wastewater charges. That's right. Yeah, okay. But we wouldn't make that decision today. That's right. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing other, I just have one question. The uh, transfer to reserve is uh, in excess of $8 million each year. Is that, uh, do we know what the balances are of, those re of that reserve? Through the chair, just bear with me one second. Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, the balance in the wastewater reserve currently is eighteen million, uh, eighteen point seven million dollars. Okay, and is is there projects lined up that will utilize that money in the next few years? There is at uh, the beginning of 2027, the balance actually dips to a low of $248,000 with all the projects that are in the next four year forecast. Okay, thank you. Seeing nothing else on five, we'll go to six. Water Services, Mayor Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so there's in terms of budget drivers for 2024 to 2027, uh, there's reference to increase in property taxes, better reflection of actuals, 205,108. Surely we're not paying property taxes to ourselves. Um, through you, Chair, uh, to Mr. Mayor. So, um, so this is again, um, an adjustment made by evaluating the property we have and the, how much taxes we're paying, it came out that we had to pay more taxes on that. I'm sure um, it, it, we added a new building uh, or admin building and uh, with the addition, there was an evaluation made and it came out that we have to pay more taxes. But we don't, we don't pay taxes on our own building, so. Um, Uh, Pat Telfer, manager of uh, revenue and tax collector. Uh, yes, we do. In uh, for we don't for administration buildings uh, like uh, the government admin buildings, like City Hall. But we do with uh, um, where we recover uh, uh, the, the rates uh, through water rates. Uh, impact will make them taxable. 
Okay. Didn't know that. So do we will we be will there be a corresponding increase in water rates to reflect that? Through the chair to Mr. Mayor, um, typically how the process works in terms of water wastewater rates is that we don't um, change the rates every year based on the need that happens during that year. Instead, we update the rates once every five years and use the reserve as a contingency balance. Um, so that way the businesses and uh, residents can expect, know what the rate is going to be for the five years. Um, mm -hmm. So we there is an increase means, yes, it will impact the rate, but then we have to say overall how much revenue we received, how much increase in expense, and then it balances out to find out where the need is to increase the rate. I can tell you from um, 23 years of experience in Brantford is that most of the time the increase is driven by capital projects, the rate increase. Okay. Um, my last question has to do with strategic budget investments. There, and over the next four years, there's one, two, three, four, five, um, four of which the cost will be recovered through increase in rates and charges, but there is one uh, mm -hmm. material material handler. Uh, 2025, <clears throat> 38,076. So why isn't that covered off by increase in water charges? Through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Mayor, um, during the budget time, um, we, you know, we, I have to kind of go back and say that we are always look for user fees um, or other means to cover our, um, any strategic investment and not to uh, increase the rate. So during budget time, um, this material handler position is funded by telecommunication companies paying for antenna, communication antennas installed on the elevated uh, tank or shallow elevated tank. So there were two businesses, telecommunication companies interested in paying for um, their antennas. Uh, and now we are actually heard that there may be a third one also interested. So each each business would pay $20,000. Um, so at the during budgeting, we only knew about two that were interested in putting the antenna up. So we had that extra money coming from the rates. Uh, but in reality, it could be funded by that another telecom company that's interested in putting the antenna on top of our elevated tank. Your time's up, Mr. Mayor. Put you on the list for a second speaking opportunity if you'd like. Councilor Carpenter, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Selby, the, the $1.9 million in increased water revenue, that's just, is that uh, just for this year or is that for, is that for, all, for the full four years? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councilor Carpenter, it is for all the four years. It's all for the four years. Okay. And could you remind us... Uh, what the rate increase is for this year? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I think every year we have water and wastewater around two and a half percent on average is the increase for water and wastewater. Okay, thank you. Councilor Sless. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, the two hundred five thousand dollars kind of the, the adjustment on, on property tax that we now are, are paying in addition because of the new the new building. Where does that show up as a revenue? to property taxes? Uh, yes, it shows up through the payment in lieu of property taxes in the uh, corporate financing uh, area of the budget. Okay, so that would show a comparable increase. I exactly, yeah. Okay. One for one. Thank you. Mayor Davis. Um, I have a motion. Can I make a motion? Go ahead. All right. So my motion is that the Material handler handler for 2025 uh, should only proceed if it will be a net zero impact to the uh, to the rate pair, i.e., that'll be picked up through charges or companies paying for telecom antennas. Okay, Councilor McCurry is willing to second that. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, we'll call the question.
just a reminder that you have to be on January 27th. The amendment carries on a recorded vote of 10 to 1. Those voting in favor, Mayor Davis, Councilors um, Secoli, Solomon Caputo, Sless, Martin McCrary, Hunt, Samuel Bentelberg. Those voting against, Councilor Carpenter. Did you have any other questions or comments, Mayor? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, the follow-up question on the property taxes, when that's assessed on our buildings, such as the uh, water treatment plant, is a portion collected for education and, and given to the, the school boards? Uh, no, there's no education portion for um, uh, city-owned properties. Okay, so it's it's strictly a, an internal transfer. Just municipal taxes on those buildings, yes. Okay, and the uh, transfer to reserve, again, is, is over $8 million. Is it, uh, do we have the, the balance and and the demand for that money? Uh, to the chair, the current balance is approximately 33 million. But again, just like the wastewater, there is capital spending that's planned to occur. And by 2027, the, ba the opening balance is expected to be just over a million dollars. Um, I did just want to also clarify on the on the previous motion that the um, ultimately the material handler is being recovered through the rates. So you would notice um, if you're looking at the 2024 to 2027 budget that the net revenues and expenditures all the way across um, for water uh, do balance to zero. So ultimately that position is being recovered through the rates. I can't explain why a portion of the cost is sort of sticking out here showing as a cost, but the recovery is being shown uh, through the increased, increased rates. And ultimately the water service does net to zero in every year. There is no cost of water falling to the tax supported budget uh, in this uh, budget. Okay, thank you. Item seven. Engineering services, Mary Davis. Yeah, the, the obvious question has to do with what is the largest single strategic budget investment for 2024. The supervisor of GIS for 106,294. And I need a really good explanation for that. Good afternoon, Jennifer Elliott, Director of Engineering Services. Through the chair to you, Mayor Davis, this is for a much needed position of a supervisor of GIS. We are extremely short staffed in our GIS department. Um, we are under reporting timelines and regulatory required timelines um, to deliver on GIS information. And this position is fully operating budget funded. Okay. Um What's GIS? <laughs> Through the chair to you, Mayor Davis. GIS is Geographical Information Systems. So that is our entire database of our assets um, into one mapping system. So there's millions of nodes and points within our mapping system that identify all of our street lights, all of our water valves, all of our hydrants, um, every asset that the city owns. So does having a supervisor speed that process up? That wouldn't you want um a, a line worker not a supervisor no that's a very good question mayor davis um currently these tasks are being split between our manager of infrastructure planning and our specialist our gis specialist um and they are extremely taxed there's a lot of overtime being seen from from those positions um so we need to make more efficient use of our time, bring this position in to focus on of all of our timelines and our regulatory requirements so that the our GIS specialists can focus on all of the data entry that we are required to do. All right, so we, we have one GIS specialist that, that does it. 
That is correct. Okay. And don't we need a second GIS specialist rather than a supervisor? Through the chair to you, Mayor Davis, we we also have two GIS technicians that do data entry. We have the GIS specialist, and then we need, there's a lot of network kind of architecture of the GIS in our system that we need to upgrade our system and make us um, modern. If I can add through the chair, Mayor Davis, as well, this manager is leading a lot of the growth related EAs. Um, so. Right now, this position, this manager's group are about with uh, without this uh, supervisor, seven wide, seven horizontal, which is kind of getting on the max of what they should be really um, uh, managing. So this will allow another uh, supervisor in that place and reduce that down from uh, seven direct reports to that would put it around to th th three, I believe, three uh, direct reports. So it allows a lot more focus on a lot of the growth-related initiatives that are coming up uh, that are being run through this group. So if, if you can, please, uh, just better explain. So if we don't do this, what's the impact <clears throat> in terms of what we produce and provide to the community? Through the chair to you, Mayor Davis, the impacts would be um, delays in our regulatory reporting and having the information into our GIS system. Um, or increased overtime charges in which to hit those those milestones. We risk burning out of our employees as they are extremely busy. And can I have a report on, on the amount of overtime? Understanding it's probably would come to us uh, confidentially. Yep. Okay. And the regulatory reporting, that's the regulatory reporting to the province, I assume. Through the chair to you, Mayor Davis, those are requirements of timelines for our assets to be available in our GIS system to properly manage our um, our locates and everything with in regards to our Safe Drinking Water Act. Okay, thank you. Councilor yeah, so McCurry. Chair, sure, thank you. Further to the Mayor's uh, commentary, could you just give us a brief verbal outline of what the org chart looks like from the GIS supervisor down? Through the chair to you, Councillor McCreary, the org chart, the hypothetical org chart with this position. Yes. So there would be the supervisor of GIS, there would be our GIS specialist, as well as two GIS technicians. So is that? And, and a student position, I apologize. So the two GIS technicians, technicians they report to the specialist? No, nobody reports up. They report directly up to our manager of infrastructure planning at this current time. So the specialist and the people that do the, I hate to say it, the people that do the work, mm -hmm. they both would report directly to the new manager. Supervisor. Supervisor, correct, yeah. Sorry, supervisor. Mm -hmm. So that supervisor would have three reports i uh, have three fte reports as well as a student position yes okay. and is that our optimal um uh reporting numbers for a supervisor through the chair so for this particular group with the work that they do that it's the amount of um, staff that they currently have what's not optimal is what the manager is managing right now. So that's where um, the need for the supervisor is because their span of control and oversight is down to co-op students and um, technicians, but really that's supervisory level so they can focus on the growth and the future planning. So that's where that piece is getting maximized rather than the supervisor position. And you, you cited regulatory reporting um, what are the penalties for failing to meet uh, those requirements? Mm -hmm. 
through the chair to you, Councillor McCurry. I don't know that value off the top of my head. I can get that for you and give that back. So have we have we been fined? No, we have not been fined at this point. Have we been sent to bed without dinner? Pardon me? Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to eight. And to give you a break, Mr. Mayor, I'll go first. The uh, there's a number of lines that have no numbers. Can somebody explain what that's all about? Good afternoon, Mike Spicer, Director of Fleet and Transit. I'm joined with Shane Pepper, the Fleet Manager, and Jerry Malcohone, our Manager of Transit Operations. Through the Chair, again, Councillor Martin, specifically, what areas is it that you are, are you looking in transit services or fleet services? Well, it says Fleet and Transit Services. There's Fleet and Men Facilities, Brantford Transit Fleet and Men, Brantford Lift Fleet and Men. Uh, operational services fleet of men, parks fleet of men, water fleet of men, golf fleet of men, uh, wastewater administration. There's no numbers for any of those. Uh, through the chair, um, to the chair. Um, those are the fleet um, allocations. So the fleet budget balances out. So the, the work is done, built to the departments and then comes back to offset the fleet charges. That's my best attempt finance to explain that. Please jump in. Uh, thanks Shane, I'll jump in, but I think that was pretty much the, the simple answer is that there's lots of ins and outs that happen through these fleet accounts. So fleet doesn't, does incur costs. All those costs are transferred over to the business units. So where you see uh, increased fleet charges in this budget is through the departments that use the fleet. So at the bottom of that page, um, because those do come to zero, we have tried to highlight within all those zero business units what those key budget drivers are. Um, so you're seeing things like um, increased fuel and increased wages and benefits being offset by a change in departmental recoveries. <laughs> okay, so there's no numbers there because they always zero out. Um, and it says in, in the budget drivers, it says increase in fleet expenses recovered. Um, okay, never mind. Uh, Mayor Davis, you said you had uh, some questions on this one. Yeah, actually, I think you covered it off. I just said a couple of comments. Uh, I found it interesting the budget survey, the, uh, the support for transit services, and certainly I hear that anecdotally from both businesses and individuals in the community, the, the transit system. I can remember when I was on, I had been playing the, the, oh yeah, I remember, but certainly in the 80s, this was often considered to be like an inconvenience. Now it's really a critically necessary service, and I think the community is telling us that through the surveys, and so I just wanted to make that observation, and also it's interesting, the one-time COVID revenue grant of 532000 hasn't quite been offset by the increase in, can, in fair revenue, which since the pandemic, we have seen a very substantive increase in, in ridership. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, to the mayor, absolutely, yes. And we're seeing an increase day by day. All right. And are we seeing situations where, where buses are nearly full to capacity? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the mayor. And again, if we define what capacity is, um, we have definitely had some standing loads. Uh, I do think that we still have some some areas where it's just uncomfortable for passengers to stand in an overcrowded bus. But uh, but again, we're doing our best to pr provide assistance where we can with additional buses. Uh, the deadheading term is what we use where we send out a, a, an extra bus in order to help uh, alleviate some of that discomfort. So we are seeing overcrowding in some areas at certain times of the day, and we've reacted by increasing the level of service or increasing the number of buses on that line or on that route. 
And, that, and that's why we've had some routes going from every half hour to 20 minutes. That is correct. Right. So we are responding to the increased need and demand, and that's reflected in the budget. That is, yes, that's okay. correct. So uh, one question for you is you look at over the next three to four years, we're also doing a transit optimization study, which is looking at the system, the way the routes are designed. Uh, you know, do we need more routes? Can we change the routes to make it more efficient? That, that could have a pretty substantive impact on our operating budget. So how how have you anticipated what that's going to say and and reflected that in the budget in like 2026 and 2027? Uh, through the chair to the mayor. And that's that's again the dynamic question, and it's a very good question. And and what we what we are anticipating to see from the optimization study is a re reimagine of the entire system. And we have um, some great flexibility in our current system. It's just not optimized to the best way of what our community needs are. So we have we have done old school planning rather than looking at what the community's needs are and reacting to it. So we have some current routes right now that have been on the same streets uh, for the same number of years. And we have opportunities here to change that and change the way that we deliver the service. And that could also mean in the service delivery model as well. So we think that the preliminary results, what we've seen, and not to not to kind of open the book too wide, but but through the survey that we received from the the public, we've seen that that customers are saying, you know, the city's grown, but the transit agency hasn't. So what we're doing is looking at how we can change before we ask for more investment. So utilize our resources internally to the best of our ability. And then where we do need to, to find strategic growth opportunities, we would then be able to provide that. And and when can we expect to see the results of the transit optimization study? Uh, by Q1 of this year. So we're, we're anticipating probably April that, we'll, that we will be able to present that to committee. Mr. Mayor, your time has expired. That's it, my questions, thanks. Okay, Councillor Sless. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Actually, the mayor asked my first question, his last question was, when, when would the uh, results be coming in from the Optimum study? And the second one was very briefly, we had a little chat ahead of the meeting and you indicated we had some pretty good news for the uh, Northwest Industrial Area. C can you maybe elaborate a little on that, please, Mike? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Sless. Yes, we've we've heard some uh, some loud cheering from the Northwest Industrial Area that we're, we're, which we're, we have been servicing for years with a special. We're looking at uh, working on ways of being able to establish a new route that would, that would perform every 40 minutes, uh, all day, every day. And so we're expecting by April to be able to in, uh, introduce that route to the Northwest Industrial, not only the, the employment areas, but also the residential areas in there as a as a temporary opportunity to alleviate some of the concerns out there, but we'll we'll see more from the optimization study of what the final routing would look like out in that area. I guess just a final follow up to that, Mike. Have we talked to the to industry out there so, so that we're kind of coordinating the, their end of shifts with our service that 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 that, that they're not coming out just as our bus went through two minutes ago and now they got to wait forty minutes? Like, have we looked at that and talked to those folks? that we know that we're, we're aligning with what they're doing? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Sless, uh, yes. So we did reach out to every business in not only the Northwest industrial area, but also the Bernada industrial area and provided them with some information on ways to engage with uh, our consultants and ourselves to understand that. We've also worked with our economic development department to understand how to contact some of these businesses. And what we're anticipating to happen uh, as the second phase of our engagement is to actually go into that area with with what we heard, and and look at what the time of the routes are, or time of the shifts, and how we can best optimize that. So we are we are talking. It's um, it's funny that every business would be nice if they all if they all worked eight to four or nine to five or. Um, but that's probably that's probably one of the biggest things that that we're struggling with at this point. But but being able to respond to that is something that we're we're working hard to be able to do. Well, congratulations, Mike, to you and your staff because it, uh, it it's overdue. Uh, they've been pleading for for a while now for for something to happen, and and now it's happening. So congratulations, well done, Councilor Carpenter. Hi, Mr. Hi, Mike. Uh... Uh, good job this year, and I, it hasn't gone unnoticed by the citizens of the community that the buses are uh, have more volume 
of people using them. Where does that reflect it in the fare box? Uh, through you, uh, Chair, to Councillor Carpenter, we are seeing, uh, well, again, we are seeing an increase in ridership. We are seeing an increase in, in some revenue, but we have an old antiquated fare collection system, and we will be replacing that uh, very shortly within the next couple of months. I do think that once we once we change that fare collection system, we'll have a better uh, understanding of how our revenue works. Currently, there's an awful lot of areas that we do need to improve on on how we collect that data and understand that data. So I think, you know, we're very pleased with what we're seeing, but once we replace the technology, we'll have a, a, a better means of being able to report it. And we'll be using the increased ridership numbers to reflect what, where we move forward in our optimization study going forward on, on what, where we provide routes to and what kind of routes and whether they're hourly or what they are? That is correct, yes. So we use all that information. So it's a good sign that the routes are picking up more people using transit. At the same time, we're doing an optimization study. Work, so timing is perfect. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, seeing nothing further on item eight, we'll move on to nine. Uh, Mayor Davis. Yes, we're at operational services, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, a couple of questions. The increase in contracted repairs and maintenance costs and volume of work, 103735 for 2024. What are the assumptions that have gone into that? And what percentage increase is that? Mark Jacklin, uh, Director of Operational Services, uh, through the chair. Uh, this is just, if you look at our infrastructure in the cities, and it's really growing. Uh, we've done a number of assessments over the past few years, especially on the uh, north lands that have been taken over. So there's some work that needs to go happen. Uh, so this is where the additional cost for that is. Uh, in, in addition to that is just the uh, average increase. Uh, supplies have gone up. Uh, so... That's where the additional costs are coming from. All right. And what's the percentage increase for 2024 in that particular item? Through the chair, I don't have that number because it goes, uh, it varies depending on the department. Can we be given that? It's not this very minute, but. Uh, through, the chair, yeah, I can, through the chair, I can get that number for you. Okay. And further down below, in terms of budget drivers, there's a reduction in the street cut program. Large fiber projects are complete. So this would be where you're cutting the street to accommodate a fiber optic project? Through the chair, that's correct. So there's one business unit on street cut restorations. Uh, so we've had to reduce that budget, although it's typically mm -hmm. uh, very neutral in cost. Uh, what goes out kind of comes in. Uh, so, but that is one big project that we were working on uh, that it has now completed in the city. So shouldn't there be brackets around that rather than it appearing without brackets? Through the chair, if, if you look at uh, 157, 110, it's a street cut restoration. So it's just showing a minor um, revenue in it. But shouldn't it be a cost reduction, not a driver, or an increase? Because you're doing less of it because there's less of the fiber optic work being done. Uh, through Chair Martin to Mayor Davis, I, I think, again, this is um, us trying to highlight the key budget drivers. So it's not explaining one-to-one -one the variance above. It's really explaining variances for the whole business unit. So there is more than one driver that's impacting that street cut restoration line, which is only changing by $3,625. Two of the major ones would be the volume increase in user fees, which is a reduction offset by a reduction in street cut program. Your time has expired, Mayor. 
Uh, Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through to staff. Uh, it says here that red light camera program, nothing right across the board. Do we not have any revenue or are we not forecasting to put more cameras in at a later date in the next four years? Through the chair, that uh, the red light camera program, any uh, money that we do make off the red light camera program goes into a reserve for road safety. Are we not putting more in though? Like, is there not going to be anything in the next four years? Through the chair, I do have uh, the projected numbers of what is expected that would go into the actual reserve. So through the chair in 2024, there could be uh, upwards of 250,000 and then it does start to decline over the next three years. Uh, we will be doing an assessment uh, on the cameras this year to determine whether we can add more cameras or if we can move the cameras uh, because the current contract ends out in 2025. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sless. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mark, do we have control over the road cuts program? And, and I'll tell you the reason I ask, and maybe you can give me an answer that makes sense because I, I couldn't get one. And I'm dealing with a a resident who's got an insurance claim because of a road cut that wasn't done correctly. And we're having trouble dealing with the insurance claim because there was three co road cuts made in four days on the same project by three different contractors. And we don't know which one belongs to that day when the damage was done. C can they just continually cut the road um, if they've got a, is that not coordinated? I guess is my answer that, that we get one guy cutting and then everybody chips in or whatever they do and they put their thing in. So through the chair, what would happen uh, when that was occurring, all the road cuts, uh, they get a permit through the city. And so basically they're in control of that area. So yes, they could do four or five different cuts. Uh, and then when it's complete, then we would come by behind and uh, inspect it. And then we would measure it and then give them the cost of how much it's going to cost to fix. Councilor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, I, I want to uh, draw your attention to uh, a line item that says increase in locates as a result of provincial regulations, which I think is $227,000. Um, could you speak a bit to that, staff? Through the chair, this is the uh, same situation that occurred in water department uh, where we're currently at uh, we were at 55% of, of uh, getting the uh, locates done within five days. And the regulatory requirement requires between 95, obviously, as, as high as 100. So in order to get there, a contractor had to hire more staff uh, to get us to that, uh, to, to be compliant. Um, so was that a negotiated uh, increase to their contract? To the chair, that is correct. And I'll ask the same question I asked earlier. Uh, what is the penalty for failing to meet those um, regulatory requirements? Uh, through the chair, when the last I was looking at is $500 a day uh, per locate not complete. Okay. And in terms of the economics, um, we save money by spending money, do we? Through the chair, that is correct. Thank you. Councilor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're doing a fine job today, by the way. Uh, Mark, uh, the uh, well, the question about red light camera program that that money doesn't that money go into the capital reserve for Vision Zero? Through the chair, that's correct. And then that committee makes recommendation to council about how to spend that money going forward for uh, traffic safety measures going forward. And through the chair, that would go through the Vision Zero yeah, Road Safety Committee, and we'd be writing reports as to where to put the money. All right. Thank you. Councilor Caputo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just question through to Mark. Um, winter control. So our snow removal, winter program, that, am I correct in saying that that doesn't operate during um, the same months as a budget? Or does it go from a certain time into 2023 into 2024? 
And if so, have we noticed any savings from last year into this budget? And then if there is, does that money go into reserves and for what for? Through the chair, it, this is a yearly budget. Uh, so it's, it doesn't go by winter, by the winter. It just goes by the year. However, there is a, a reserve for winter. It's for our salt and sand and for our uh, contracted services. So between that, have we noticed anything so far into last year or to this year? Is there like, has there money been going into the reserves? And if there is, how much? Through the chair, we haven't completed the 2023 budget yet, but I will let finance the last, uh, at, at the end of 2022, we were at approximately $2 million in the reserve. Thank you. Before I go to second time speakers, I said one question regarding the locates. Was it not in the contract with the contract originally to do the locates within five days? Or were they allowed longer because of the? Through the chair, uh, it, yes. They were allowed longer previous to the provincial yes. change? Okay. Councillor Sless. Just a couple further to the, uh, the, the snow removal budget. That, that's a rolling budget, is it not? Like if we have a good year this year, it goes into reserve, then you grab that reserve. If you have a bad year next year, and it just smooths out the process that we're not up and down. Through the chair, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, just double checking that. And secondly, the locates. When the locates are done, how long are they valid? Through the chair, my understanding is 60 days. 60 days. Because I've seen instances where, where kids play with little flags and they're throwing them all over and there's no flags left. And like, that could be very dangerous. There's something under there that uh, shouldn't be under there or that they need to know is under there. And then the flags are gone and the people doing construction have no idea where that flag was. Do they have to relocate that? Through the chair, that's up to the contractor to request the flags. Uh, but when they do get their package actually from um, our, our contractor, it has a map of everything. So you don't actually need the flags. It's just okay. sometimes they may request them. So that's just a, uh, to make a, it easier. That's a back up to the paper. Okay. It was scary seeing that. I thought something bad could happen here because nobody really knows where those flags went or and, and kids don't understand what they're doing. They're just playing. Okay. No, I appreciate the response. Thank you. Mayor Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm looking at the budget from 2025 to 2027. Strategic budget investments. They're very substantial. And so I'd like an explanation. Starting with 2025, Supervisor of Road Compliance, like 150,000. Yes, through the chair. The Supervisor of Road Compliance would be responsible for the city's right of way uh, and permits and road patrol and the development and implementation of the technology that's occurring within the Operational Services Department. So as you know, operational services programs, we have to adhere to regulatory compliance uh, through the uh, utilization of technology. So we're using our GIS mapping, our software, artificial intelligence. So all, these are all programs that we're utilizing right now. Uh, and without the utilization of this technology, it would make our programs uh, less effective or efficient. So you can, our road network has pretty much doubled in the last 25 years and but our staff have not and the reason why that's not occurred is because we we're able to utilize this technology uh, and so but what's occurring right now is we're at that point where you know, the manager just can't control that on the side of his desk with the three technologists and so we need a supervisor to to utilize all this technology and we're using more and more technology every day like i mentioned artificial intelligence through our road patrol program we're starting to use that as well so we definitely need some oversight on uh, that whole program in order to keep it efficient so how many people would this person be supervising this person would be supervising five road patrollers uh so one lead hand a lead hand road patroller and four 
row patrollers and three technologists and a student. Okay, and so who's currently doing that? The manager of road uh, or contracts and compliance. And then in 2026, there's two categories, traffic maintenance signs. And just just says that for 105,000, what's that? The traffic maintenance sign position uh, creates signs, banners, and markings. So they're using our printers in the uh, traffic department. Uh, through the audit and accountability fund uh, service review, they asked us to look at uh, additional staff member in the science department in order to actually, instead of having to contract out a lot of sign maintenance across the city that the other departments use, we'd be able to bring that in-house. Uh, we'll also hopefully have a new operational services building in the next two to three years. Uh, the current building size, we just don't have the, the capacity for two staff in there right now. So there's not enough room. So the new building would, would have the ability to have that. The other piece to it is, again, our sign inventory, like just like our road inventory, has doubled uh, over the last 25 years, and it's still one person. And uh, when that person goes on vacation, we need signs purchased. It's it's making it very, very difficult. So we do need some backup and some coverage. So currently, the signs are being produced through contract, outside contractors. And through the chair, a, major, a lot of it is done in-house through the one sign person, but we do have to contract out a number of different signs. And so with this person, we wouldn't need to have any more outside contractors doing signs. Mm -hmm. That's the, the rationale? Yeah, through the chair. There's still these obviously blank signs that we would purchase that would still be cheaper to purchase, like a stop sign, uh, but all the street signs uh, and then all the other types of signs and and that we can create to help other things in the city. Uh, that's that's what this position would be used for. And what are we currently paying per year to the outside sign contractors? <clears throat> Through the chair, I don't have that number for you. I can get that for you, though. Okay, thanks. And then the Mr. other, Mayor, you've exceeded your time. I put put my hand up for third time. Um, before we go to third time speakers, uh, traffic events. It's what exactly is that, and why is it up one hundred and fifty percent? Through the chair, the the reason for that increase is the uh, sixty thousand dollar increases for the traffic um, uh, after the Bulldogs games. So we contract out the police to ensure the traffic uh, is flowing correctly. Okay, so that's uh, traffic control for special events. Correct. Okay. Councillor Sless. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mark, do we have the <clears throat> the capability or the, or the the wherewithal to to stream during a snow event uh, the removal vehicles that somebody could go online and look and see where those things are in relative to their home? and they could then make their own calculation as to when they would get plowed and when they can get out. Do we have that capability? Through the chair, we have, I mean, you see a lot of cities call it map my plow. Uh, so we do have technology through our G, uh, through our AVL, uh, but it would create a, a lot of work on our end that we just don't have the staff to do right now. Uh, there are a number of different routes and they're always changing. So. Uh, there'd be a lot of work going behind the scenes in order to do that, but it is possible. Okay. So we have the capability. We don't have the manpower. Correct. Okay. And secondly, um, I've noticed uh, in an example I'll use is Oakville because I was there the other day. And every exit off the QEW going into Oakville, as you come off and come to a stoplight to decide whether you're going left or right on their street, once you've ex exited the highway, they have a nice sign there that says, welcome to Oakville, enjoy your stay, or, or something along that line. W would that be something that, that could be done within your current budget? The, the, a few of these signs at the, I think we have five ex entrances and exits to the city, just at the entrances uh, that they have welcome. And I thought that that's just a nice personal touch. And, and it feels like they, you're valued as a visitor to their community. And I think it's a good thing to do. I just didn't know the cost on that. If we don't have the capability, could you give me a number that, that it would take to do that? Not tonight, but could you send me a, an email? 
Yeah, I, I can actually speak to it. That, that is one of our goals uh, next year is, or, is to get some of these signs up and running. Uh, you, you obviously see, we have to do an assessment, obviously, but there's two signs on the 403. Then our major routes that are coming into the city, we'd obviously want some larger signs and then the smaller cities like such as Colburn Street uh, out by the airport, you might have a smaller sign. Uh, so yep. we are working on that. We're trying to get some designs together, working with communications and a cost and a budget in order to get that complete. Okay, that, that's good. I think that's just a nice personal touch and just, just kind of says welcome. Thank you. Councilor Carpenter. Sorry to follow that up. And just by coincidence, we have the same five number of interchanges that Oakville has, but just five, just which, which are one of my favorite signs. The uh, traffic maintenance signs, is this in the 2026 budget, when it comes up, will that show an offsetting a decrease in expenses then somewhere along, along the line in purchasing? Sorry, could you ask that again? So you, you, to the mayor's comments, your traffic maintenance signs that 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 you we're contracting a lot of that out. So when we hire this individual to do that in-house, we'll see an offsetting decrease in in our contract services for signs somewhere else in the budget. Through the chair. So a lot of that would come through the other departments, provided we're able to get, you know, to complete some of their signs, because that would be internal uh, recovery. So we'd have an internal recovery for that, though, if we're doing the work, right? Yes. All right. Thank you. Mayor Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My uh, last question uh, has to do with strategic, strategic budget investments, and it's for 2026 operational services, operator drivers, 185,140. So the, the question is, how many uh, operators slash drivers does that <laughs> contemplate, and why in 2026? Through the chair, that's uh, two operators to be brought in. And it, the the plan is obviously we want to stage things through to maximize the budget. Uh, we'd like to get our supervisor of road compliance in to make everything as more efficient as possible and add these uh, drivers. Uh, I think, as I mentioned before, we know that uh, the road uh, network has really increased in the city over the past 20 years, pretty much doubled. Uh, but we still need staff to do the the actual work, you know, picking up the garbage, uh, plowing, and everything. But haven't we tended to uh, to? I mean, this is not a new phenomenon, which is adding roads to our system, which increases the need for this type of a service. Haven't we in the past generally tried to address that need for increased service through uh, contracting with outside operators? Through the chair, there is a number of ports and, and stuff that like, for example, the parks ops reviews uh, that we're looking at. And there's and we're always continually looking at whether we can contract out or bring back in-house. Uh, but for the for, for the current duties that we are performing, in order to, to ensure that we are able to maintain that, we do need additional staff. So my last question, uh, Mr. Chair, is kind of generally in respect to these strategic budget investments in years beyond 2024 uh, and it goes to Joel. Joel, when these, when we do the, the, I may have asked this last week, but I just want to make sure. So when we're doing the reviews in 2025 for the budget that year, will these strategic budget investments come back to us for review approval and reconsideration? Mm -hmm. Uh, through Chair Martin to Mayor Davis. Yes, yeah, certainly the act does require us to come back with a budget confirmation. And assuming that we're uh, in line with what we've proposed percentage-wise and dollar value-wise, our, our recommendation would be to reconfirm the budget that includes these positions. If something extraordinary happens that we didn't plan for, we may need to look at repri reprioritizing to uh, come within the targets that we've set out through this budget. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, that brings us to the end of uh, um, public works. So we'll start with uh, parks and recreation facilities when we come back from the recess. Uh, we'll be back at 6.35. Start it again. So we're on aquatics and fitness. Um, Councillor McCurry. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Oops, sorry. Um, just I'm just looking for staff to explain the one, two, three, four, five uh, budget drivers with respect to uh, aquatics and fitness. Um, through the chair, Councillor, we have our uh, entire Parks and uh, Recreation Services Management team here to answer questions either virtually or in, in, in person. And I'm this. My name's Rick Cox. I'm the director of Parks and Recreation for the city. I'm happy to introduce. Walter sure. Barrientos, who's the manager of aquatics and fitness, to respond to your question. Okay, thank you. Through the chair, uh, to Councilor McCreary. So a couple of our items for our budget drivers. So one of the items is the removal of the 2023 one-time COVID grant. Um, that was what uh, obviously allowed us to maintain our operations last year. And this year, we won't have access to that. Um, our other budget drivers are going to be our rates and fees have been adjusted um, with the intention of maximizing our swim lesson participation and our rental fees. So we're, we're losing $370,000 in uh, free provincial cash, are we? Is that what that means? That's correct. Yes. So we uh, no longer have access to that. So we have uh, had to adjust our fees accordingly. Okay. So... Uh... We did not um, increase our complement or our services when we were awarded the 370 originally, did we? Uh, I apologize. Uh, through the chair, can you please repeat the question? When we got the 370 from the provincial government, we didn't go on a spending spree hiring staff and doing cool things? No, that's correct. That was subsidized. Through the chair, that's correct. Uh, we were okay. essentially subsidizing our operations. And uh, so you're you're going to be charging an extra three hundred thousand uh, to users. Uh, through the chair, that is correct. Yes. So essentially, um, we we will be able to make that up. Our revenue will be able to essentially meet where it's supposed to be now uh, that we have a staffing complement where it should be, and our operations are back to what they were uh, essentially pre-COVID. So we will be able to generate more revenue to offset that. So the users, the user numbers have returned um, to the numbers prior to the virus? Uh, so just about, yes, that's right. We've actually uh, increased, this is our January is the highest amount of swim lesson registrations that we've had in the past, essentially since 2019. So we are returning back to that, same with our rentals. So the base salaries, benefits from your organization, no new staff this year? No, we've essentially hired everyone that we need to hire uh, for the present. Um, as and so as of right now, we are. Um, so as of right now, we are essentially running what we are able to run without needing to hire any more staff. And was any thought given to uh, making any type of reduction to accommodate the loss in revenue? Uh, through the chair, yes. Yeah. So essentially, so what we've had to do through the loss of revenue is um, essentially just adjust our staffing fees, adjust some of our programming offerings uh, while maximizing um, some community-based registration programs to offset that. No, but my, my question is, oh, is there any consideration given to lowering your um, your costs? Uh, through the chair, so essentially we didn't increase our fees for 2024. Uh, we didn't look at decreasing, but essentially uh, we looked at offering more options. So, for example, the weight room membership that will allow for members to uh, still have a membership at a reduced fee. So then that way it's still less and they can still access the facility. Uh, we just kind of broken it down so then that way they are more affordable. Uh, let me uh, let me ask uh, one more time, Joaquim. Um, sure. Was there any consideration given to reducing your operating costs in light of the loss of revenue? Oh, I see. Uh, my apologies. So through the chair, uh, no, uh, we didn't look at reducing any of our operating costs uh, just because, again, what we felt was we needed to ensure that we were maintaining the right amount of swim lessons and drop-ins for the community. Okay, thank you for that. Can I just, uh, I, I just, maybe I can add to help with keynote. So we did during COVID time periods. Is that what you're asking, Council? I'm not sure what you're, if that's your, during COVID, we eliminated all the part-time staff. Uh, they were all reduced. Uh, all those reductions were done, reduced. Uh, and, and Wayne Gretzky Sports Center was operating on the fitness side and Aquatics Center was operating when it was closed, operating at some very minimal staff just to keep the, the lights on. So I think there was a reduction in staff. It's now gone back up to its previous levels pre-COVID. And that's where we're looking at the previous levels of revenue as well. Councilor Carpenter. 
Thank you. Uh, further to Councilor McCurry's uh, inquiry, the uh, $418,398, it's down here as rates and fees adjustments and usage changes. How much is rates and fees and how much is increased usage? Through the chair. Um, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rick. Sorry, through the chair uh, to Councillor Carpenter. Most of that is about additional revenue from programs. We have uh, flatlined our user rates and fees for 2024 over 2023 for aquatics programming and rentals. And over the next uh, three years, we've uh, incorporated the um, corporate direction in terms of increasing the rates as per the guidance from finance. So the mo the, the large portion of this $400,000 that you're seeing over the four years is related to increased usage rather than an increase in the per, uh, per program or per rental fee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor Sless. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. How much has ICE rental gone up uh, an hour? Through uh, through the chair, we're we're talking about aquatics right now, so I'll just have to pull up my my arena rates. Hold on a minute, and we'll get that answer for you. I'm sorry, we we can wait till we get there. I was just looking at uh, Ed Gretzky, and I'm good. I'll ask the question when we get there, Rick, so it doesn't get out of out of whack. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. Yeah, specifically looking at uh, 2023 to 2024 for the Woodman Park Pool Program. Um, the Woodman Park Pool, I understand, is is to be open early in 2024. So, is there um, a reason for the forty one thousand dollar variance? It's, it's a good chunk of uh, a good chunk of the variance for um, that entire business unit. Through the, through the chair, the uh, in 2023, the Woodman uh, budget did not get used at all because the project never uh, finished. In 2024, the staff that we have in place now uh, reevaluated the program opportunities and identified considerable additional program opportunities. So what you're seeing really is a, a, an increase in the projected revenue has re, uh, reduced the tax sub, the subsidization we're required we're expecting for Woodman Pool. In 2023, the budget didn't include nearly as much revenue as we're anticipating in 2024. So, so through, uh, through you to Rick. So when you said the the budget, so we've got eighty nine thousand four hundred and thirty one dollars that was budgeted for twenty twenty three, but we didn't use that that money at all. So where did it go? Um, do you want to? So that budget was not tapped into in twenty twenty three because the project wasn't complete. Now help my my finance friends to help me finish that answer. Uh, through the chair. Right. So at, because we didn't use those do dollars in 2023, it just becomes part of our year end uh, surplus deficit uh, number. Thank you. For Gretzky Center Aquatics and Gretzky Center Fitness and Recreation, there's an 80% and a 65%. Uh, actually, it's a reduction in, in revenues. What's the reason for, for the large percentages there? Through the chair to the chair, as uh, Joaquin indicated earlier, um, the significant uh, reduction in revenue is related to no longer being able to access the COVID subsidy. And okay. so we are losing $370,000 in revenue from that portion of the what that we were able to use in 2023. We're anticipating $300,000, give or take, in additional revenue. And the largest, uh, the, the large, the reason for the large percentage difference is because three hundred is significantly less than three hundred and seventy thousand. Okay, so those are the two lines that are impacted by the the COVID. So that's correct. Okay, Councilor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you, um, Rick. One thing I forgot that just came to mind. Um, could you tell me if we settled on a rate yet? If you and I want to go in there on a Tuesday night and play underwater rugby together. Through the chair, yes, we have a plan for that. Uh, we're going to be bringing on an underwater program 
uh, to allow that uh, folks that want to play that sport to continue. So we have found a way to accommodate that. And that includes underwater polo as well? So far, it's just rugby. We haven't seen any polo. We haven't had, I haven't had any polo conversations, but maybe Joaquin has. We don't have any horses. Thank you. Councilor Carpenter, did you wish to speak again? Yes. Yeah. Marco Polo. Anyways, uh, Woodman Park Pool Program. That pool was a replacement of the existing pool, which had a heater. This one has going to have a heater too? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so we will get the full season out of it now. Thank you very much. Any other speakers to item 10? Seeing none, we'll move on to 11. Councilor Caputo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question through the staff. Uh, Lions Park Arena um, increase of uh, basically 261000 give or take, and 307000 over the next four years. Is there breakdown, what it is, what's happening? Hi, Sonny Smith, Manager of Arena Operations, through the chair to Councillor Caputo. Um, so the Lions Park Arena increase is basically a reorganization of the staff that were in place and it was done through an HR report, um, plus the addition of the supervisor of Civic and Lions. So 50% of that salary would go to Lions. Um, staff were formerly deployed to um, parks services for the summer. And we've eliminated that process where we have full-time parks employees and full-time marine employees. So those wages are 100% in the business units. So it's specifically wages. It has nothing to do with renovations, costs, anything like that? It's mostly wages, correct. Through the chair, just to supplement that, um, there were... This uh, 2024 and going forward, you're also seeing a significant effort to um, put the costs where they are being expended rather than have them um, uh, supported through the Wayne Gretzky Center budget. So if you will note uh, overall, the Wayne Gretzky Center budget percentage increase is not nearly as much as some of the other facilities. And part of that is because we're shifting staff dollars that were previously cap uh, captured in the Gretzky budget to Lions and Civic where they truly belong. So is there shared employees between all the facilities that would be able to maybe compensate for some of this? Through the chair to Councillor Caputo. Um, yes, the, the staff do backfill where we need them. Um, we try to get them through scheduling, through vacation coverage um, to reduce overtime. Um, this is part of the process. This is the first time that we're going to be going through this for the summer. And part of the process is these arena operators, facility operators will be picking up some of the, the grounds maintenance and other aspects that were normally done by park staff that would have to come to the site and, and pick up that work. So now they can do more service levels in their areas and in the sports fields and the trails and other areas like that. The other thing is, as Rick mentioned, um, we're going to be trying to get a better reflection on where the wages are actually spent rather than just building it to where we're budgeted to. So this is a base budget for the, for this year, for 2024. Um, I do expect that this is going to become, that this will be, this will see a, a lower impact to the budget than what is on paper, but we're budgeting for worst case scenario as the people, the, the staff are doing work at, uh, in other business units. Thank you. Councilor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you through you to staff. Alliance Park and um, Civic Center, um, can you tell us approximately uh, the percentage of say daily ice time that's utilized at each of those facilities? Through the chair to Councillor McCreary, um, are you talking about non-prime ice daytime or just uh, per day? Per day. So we open at 0700 and we're done at 10 probably, right? 
So at Civic Center, um, we would open at 0700 at Lions Park. Um, there will be staff on site, not necessarily there to accommodate rentals. Um, as we mentioned to Councillor Caputo. So do we staff Lions Park when there's no activity there? No, we do not. Okay. So you're, but when you're looking at the allocation of expenses, you're, you, you said your supervisors, 50% at Lions, 50% at Civic Center. Um, is, is that a, is that a, I don't know that that's any more of a, uh, a fair allocation than it was before, uh, because Civic Center is a lot heavily used and Lions is dark most of the time. Through the chair, Councillor McCreary, um, they both run about the same length of season being September to March. Um, we expect that the Civic Center will run longer. Um, this year with the Bulldogs being present. The facilities themselves do have other uses, such as the auditorium at Lions Park and the lounge at uh, Civic Center. The auditorium at Lions Park has seen an increase in usage, uh, which requires staff preparation, supervision, and, and setup. Um, we've also been doing a great deal of uh, um, maintenance to the facility to try to um, <clears throat> encourage users that were upset with the Bulldogs pushing them out of their preferred time to Lions Park to accommodate them. Uh, strategic budget investments, which used to be called unmet needs, um, 65,000 for an aquatics arena operator. Can you uh, tell us a bit about that? Uh, through the chair to Councillor McCreary, uh, that is a an, an unmet need, a new position, strategic initiative. Um, to enhance the aquatics um, knowledge base and coverage. Uh, currently we run with two uh, aquatic staff to uh, based out of the Gretzky Center. And then in the summertime, they cover the Wayne Gretzky Center, Earl Hag, and now the new Woodman Park Pool. Um, the intent of this position is to ensure that we're able to be at all three places at once if required um, due to regulations and mechanical issues or whatever might pop up. And with the two current staff that we have, they are fairly senior staff and we need vacation coverage as well, which is most likely to happen in the summer. So um, with the, the two outdoor pools and, and the Gretzky Center pools, uh, we don't wanna see ourselves short. And the reason that we're adding the arena component is to um, have that person provide assistance on the arena side for backfilling, sick calls, vacation during the winter season when mm -hmm. we don't have the two yeah. outdoor pools so that we can have a more balanced complement right. across the facility. Thank you. Councilor Schloss. Thank you, Chair. I'll throw you to Rick. Rick, as I understand it, then there's going to be time freed up uh, for some of your parks folks because they won't be doing work that they were doing at, at arenas. Is that, did I understand that exchange correctly? Through the chair to Councillor Sless, the, re, the reconfiguration we've been doing on uh, within my group over the last year has uh, seen, as Sonny indicated, um, a change in having staff that spent part of their time in parks and part of their time in arenas to having uh, a, a people either in one or the other. So we actually end up with fewer people in parks uh, overall than we had before because of the way the math works out. You can't, you can't uh, take four people and split them evenly. Uh, we ended up with three in each. So we are actually, we have actually reduced the, the, the parks complement uh, through the summer as part of this process. The other thing I will add is I would would, would say is that as we um, take a look at the parks operation, we're seeing that we're not meeting all of the expectations we have across our our uh, our portfolio. So while you're while it is true that there may be uh, some staff who used to do some or would have previously been assigned to do work around Lions Arena, um, they will be able to do work in the sports fields uh, in that and do do a, an enhanced job, a better job of meeting expectations within the sports fields. It's, it's not, it wouldn't be accurate to suggest that there's an opportunity for reduction on the park side. 
No, I, I, I was actually looking for an enhancement to service. Uh, it's a common uh, complaint I get that, that our, our playing fields, whether they be baseball, soccer, whatever they are, uh, are not to the standard of the traveling teams that play in other cities. They're getting better service in other cities. The, the standard is higher, and we're, in some cases, quite a bit lower as far as a standard. And I was hoping that this adjustment of staff would help bring that standard up, and it sounds like it is. It's, it's part of the solution through the chair. It's part of the solution. And as we get to the park section of the budget, you'll see further strategic budget initiatives that are proposed to help us meet those expectations. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to Sonny. Uh, any of the, the budget numbers that are associated with Lions Park, are they with, um, with regards to bringing back public skate as this is a very common theme in West Brand? through the chair to Councillor Sullivan. Um, we are hopeful that we can increase all of our programs, all of our rentals. Um, but we're just not there for staff wise yet. Um, we are waiting for some decisions to be made through the uh, collective bargaining agreement and the budget process, but um, public skating is on our radar for uh, Lions Park Arena. So this could look like tweaking later on. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, so anybody else on number 11? Councilor Carpenter. Just for a follow-up. So, so this 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 budget has a 16% increase overall for this business unit. Am I reading that right? Through the chair, yes, 16.31% in the first year. And over the four-year cycle, it's a 6.69%. Yeah, okay. yeah, three, three next year and three the year after. Now the uh, the, the program and service of men that's that's up by one hundred and thirty thousand. Is that just wages, or is is that is that what all that is? is wages, or is there a program to in, increase in program activity? That that the majority of that increase uh, is going to be labor and and other uh, contracted service cost increases. And what's the big increase driver for the civic center? Uh, I thought we were getting revenue for that new revenue from Bulldogs. Do we not, not do well on that? It doesn't cost us. We don't have to staff it. Through the chair to Councillor Carpenter. Um, the Bulldogs are increasing our revenue slightly. Um, we are seeing, depending on the day um, that they play, um, basically, a, if they play on a Saturday, we're seeing a almost a in and an out compared to the BCHL rentals and minor hockey rentals that we would have had. Uh, where we see an improvement in revenue is if they play on a weekday where we don't displace as many um, user groups. Um, and every Bulldogs game that we do have does see an increased, uh, a much higher staff complement to provide the service than we would for a BCHL or a minor hockey game. And that staff complement is not funded by the Bulldogs themselves? Um, the Bulldogs through the chair to Councillor Carpenter, the Bulldogs cover security, ushers, uh, food and beverage. We we cover um, ice maintenance, um, part-time staff, and janitorial. Okay. So what's the what's the big driver here in increasing this uh, ten percent? What's the big driver for this? Other through the chair to Councillor Carpenter, the big driver is probably the game day um, staffing where you're. Okay. Four you. times as many part-time staff on shift. Thank you. Councillor Schloss. No? Councillor McCurry. Chair, uh, sure, thank you. Um, how many folks do we have on game day? Through the chair to Councillor McCreary, we supply um, a full-time operator all day um, and, and two custodians to prep the facility. And for the the night, the, the time of the game, we have two operators, four custodians, and four rank attendants. Sorry, five custodians. I'm sorry, how many rank attendants? Four. What do they do? The rank attendants are responsible for um, removing the nets for the Zambonis and the pegs. Um, and there are any snow removal as we had on Friday um, to clear the exits 
um, minor upkeep of the facility between periods. Broken doors, that sort of thing. That's correct. And anything that might go wrong on the ice. Right, thank you. Okay, anybody else on item 11? Seeing none, item 12, Mayor Davis. Mind seeing if any other members have questions and come back to me? Sorry, it's jumping around. Um, so we're at... Bell Homestead. Yeah, I, I didn't have any questions about Bell Homestead other than... Yes, just getting to it. Yeah. It's mail. Yeah. Uh, so the question I had, uh, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> was the change from 2023 to 2024 is 17.28% is, is the extent to which that is goes beyond 2 or 3%. Is that solely due to the 150th anniversary? Uh, through the chair to Mayor Davis, uh, Brian Wood, curator. Um, <clears throat> no, the uh, 250th anniversary shows up in the special projects business unit. Uh, the increase to the Bell Homestead operating uh, budget is primarily due to a reevaluation of an existing position. Uh, the museum assistant position uh, was submitted for reevaluation with human resources in 2022. It was completed in 2023 after budget was approved, and the position was bumped from level A to level D, which resulted in um, a 65% increase uh, in the salary for that position, the hourly rate for that position. <clears throat> Well, I guess if I had more questions about that, we'd have to go in camera. But uh, in reference to the special projects, $25,000, that's the 150th anniversary? That is the 150th, yes. Right. What about, uh, is there a possibility of any uh, funding coming from, isn't there a foundation, the Bell? There's various foundations I know that have had an interest from time to time in the Bell Homestead. Uh, some of that uh, related to the Bell Corporation. So what are we going to be doing to try and find contributions or corporate donations to cover off this cost? Uh, through the Chair to Mayor Davis, uh, we are submitting a request to Bell Canada for $10,000 uh, towards uh, the 150th. Uh, we have also submitted an application to the Department of Canadian Heritage uh, for a grant that would uh, assist with the activities of that weekend, July 26th. At this point, though, we have not received confirmation from either. And so this dollar amount assumes there, there are no contributions or donations? Correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Councilor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what you have planned for the celebration. Uh, through the Chair to Councillor McCreary. So we are looking at uh, actually four days of events. Uh, the anniversary date is July 26th. So we're actually going to start on July the 25th uh, with uh, an outdoor showing of the 1939 20th Century Fox movie, The Story of Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, the interesting part of this was that it was actually banned by Brantford City Council when it was released by 20th Century Fox because it did not mention Brantford, uh, resulting in 20th Century Fox putting a disclaimer at the beginning of the movie giving credit to Brantford. So this is probably one of the first times it's been shown publicly in Brantford in, in many decades. Uh, the next night, July 26, we are going to uh, partner with... Uh, um, music in the Square. Uh, we will have a concert that primarily focuses on uh, music that somehow relates to the telephone. That is still in the works. Uh, 
Uh, the 27th, we will be hosting a, a rather large event here at the Homestead. Uh, we are completely redesigning the telephone exhibition gallery in the Henderson home. Uh, that will be the official opening of that gallery. Uh, so we'll be hosting a, a garden party here at the site. Uh, for that, we'll also be uh, undertaking a book launch. And then that evening uh, with Brandt uh, Theatre Workshops, we will be hosting a presentation of the uh, production, Helen, Annie and Alec. And at this point, we're looking at bringing John Tench back to Brantford, who portrayed Mr. Bell in the Murdoch Mysteries series to uh, play uh, Mr. Bell once again. And then we'll wrap things up the next day on the 28th with what we're calling the Brantford to Paris Trail Track, which will start in Harmony Square. It is an 18 kilometer white, uh, walk, bike or run uh, event, which celebrates the uh, world's first successful long distance telephone call between the two towns. So it'll begin in Harmony Square and it will finish up at the Silapse Community Center with the Paris Museum and Archives uh, hosting at that end. Wow, you've given a lot of uh, thought and work in this already, Brian. When are you going to come to council and uh, and tell us about this in a public venue? Uh, more uh, through the chair to Mayor, uh, Councillor McCurry, there will be more information coming uh, within the next few weeks. We're just confirming a few things and, and we'll bring a memo forward to council. Excellent. Thank you very much. Seeing no other speakers for 11, we'll go on to 13. Councillor Caputo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Question to the staff. Um, community events. I see that it's going to 262. And as we move forward, uh, there's increments in there. Um, just want to know how much is actually allocated to what I'm hoping is going to be wonderful summer and winter carnivals, festivals. So, Laurie Dawn, I know it's not Friday morning. So I thought maybe I'd put this through to you. Uh, through the chair, uh, Lori Don Caven, Manager of Community Recreation and Events. Thanks for the question. Uh, there will be a report coming forward to City Council to address specifically, Councillor Caputo, your uh, resolution with regards to a summer and a winter festival. So the budget um, that is before you today does not reflect um, any of those two celebrations. Okay. So when it does come to council and we approve it, where is that money going to be coming from? I understand that I'm asking or I'm looking for real festivals, big community-based, community-involved, tourism-based festivals. Through the chair to Councillor Caputo, yes, mm -hmm. um, you and I have had uh, several Friday morning conversations and your, your vision is quite clear. Um, so we will be bringing forward the cost estimates and the program plan for consideration of council, uh, along with a funding source um, that council will debate and put a, a motion on the floor to approve or not. Thank you. Any other questions on this number 13? Seeing none, we'll move on to 14. Mr. Mayor. Ask for other people, just gotta catch up here. Does anyone else have any questions on 14? Councillor Slice. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to <clears throat> to Rick. Rick, I've, I've been looking through and I'm trying to find the um, <clears throat> lawn bowling at, at Gretzky. And, and I this is facilities. I don't see it there. And I, I wasn't finding it later on. C can you uh, assure me that it's in here and I'm going to stumble onto it shortly? Through the chair, that's in the capital project uh listing that we'll get to later on on the agenda. Okay, so so it's been addressed through this budget process. That's correct. Thank you. Councillor Hunt. Uh, thank you, and through you to staff, um, the $171,000 increase to the parkade 
Um, this is this is the operating budget. So this is not related to somebody. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, additional security or, or let's let's just ask for an explanation on the hundred and seventy two thousand dollar increase at the parkade operations. Through the chair, Kim Weiskell, manager of facility operations, we had a, a request from the security section through Dave Weedrick section to increase the security at the parkade. And we were asked to put this in to fund, I believe, two full-time security guards addition to the parkade. Uh, now that staff are, are parking there and the Bulldogs are there, this has been a request from them and they asked for us to put this into the budget this year. Okay, so through uh, I, I guess this is a question for Joelle. I, I know Mr. Weedrick presented his the security budget last Wednesday. So this this is a recommendation from that department that that's showing up in this department. Is that am I correct in that assumption? Uh, through Chair Martin to Councillor Hunt. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Mayor Davis. Yeah, on that on that subject, the increase in private security contract complement, Kim. So what specifically is that in relation to? And is it entirely the parkade? First of all, that's the first question. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's entirely through the chair. It's entirely through for the parkade. It's to fund two full-time security officers that do nothing but work at the parkade. All right, and that's to ensure the 24-7 security presence. Correct and the monitoring of the security 80, cameras 80 cctv cameras correct okay and it's in the hopes of it is to reduce some um, a lot of the vandalism that's happening there as well and to also ensure safety of the people that are parking there okay thank you you're welcome any further on 14 Councillor mccurry uh, thank you, Chair. We don't have a budget uh, cited this year for either the courthouse or the tourism building. Do we not have any costs for either of those? So through the chair, the tourism building is uh, being funded through the police now that the police have taken over that building. So it's of no cost to us. And the courthouse is being paid for through court services. It's a cost recovery through the court services. So have we transferred title of the tourism building to the police? Uh, no, we uh, facilities uh, has title to the to that. If police are just renting it, as far as I understand, but Brian maybe has more information on that. Okay, so if we're as part of the as part of the uh, new police station build, the police will be using the tourism center. Uh, it's not it's 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 being built through the capital budget, so the police capital budget is not to their operating budget. We still own and operate the building, and they're paying us. Should there yes. not be a revenue? And but it's uh, through the capital process. budget process, so they're they're paying a uh, a fee through the capital. Like they're they're being charged against the capital budget, not an operating. Okay, so yeah, all right, thank you, Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can somebody please explain why we have almost a three hundred thousand dollar increase between twenty twenty four and twenty twenty five on one Market Street? So let me just change screens here. Between 2024 and 25? Yeah. So for 20 in in 2024, that building will be vacated on February 2nd when the CSSD department moves across the street. And the expenses for um that one market street building is going to be funded from the capital POA project for 2024. And when staff move in in 2025 then you'll see the expenses come back to the operating budget. Okay, now the operating budget currently for 2023 was 292,000. Now we're gonna be going up to 450. <laughs> Through the chair. Well, there is a cost increase from Laurier. Um, I think Rick might be able to better speak to this, um, but we are looking at the POA or sorry, the CSSD had a smaller footprint 
26,600 square feet are now going to be taken over by the POA in 2025. The POA, okay. yeah. Thank I don't you. Know Rick wants to expand on that. You've answered fine. Thanks, Kim. Hey, seeing nothing further on that, we'll move on to golf. Uh, this is one that I wanted. Um, what exactly is F and B dash F P two? Through you, Mr. Chair, Jeff Moore, business manager of golf operations. Uh, golf is under finance policy two, where any uh, surplus is a transfer to reserve. Okay. What's what's F and B? Through you, Mr. Chair, food and beverage. Okay. And why is it 143% uh, change in the budget? It's going from a revenue in, in 23 to an expense in 24. Can someone explain that, please? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm sure we're all aware uh, we're in interesting financial times and our day-to-day -day food and beverage revenue has been slowly decreasing uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, part of our goals this year, we've engaged our talented communications team to come up with a plan to help drive the food and revenue or food and beverage revenue for us on a daily basis. And it's our hope this year that uh, that number is going to turn around with their guidance and assistance with us. Okay. Any other questions on golf? Councillor Hunt. Uh, just a question in uh, the worksheet that we're working mm -hmm. from. Golf has zero figures, um, and yet we have figures in the workbook. Okay. And I'm getting a, an answer from the mayor. Go ahead, jo Joel. Yeah, that would be just a, a question. I just was looking at one sheet didn't 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 jive with the other. Yeah. Okay. So on the on the worksheet, that's a net number. So that's a net tax levy number, which is zero because the tax levy is not supporting golf services. So actually, in the budget workbook, that zero corresponds to the net revenue expense line, which is zero. What the bottom line is, is the um, trans the surplus transfer to the reserve. Thank you for that explanation. Mayor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. To uh, Jeff, so the where does the reserve stand at the end of 2023? And is it a, and is it a specific golf reserve? Through you, Mr. Chair, I'll let the finance staff give the exact amount of the golf reserve but it is specific for golf. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, it is uh, $410,000. And how much has that increased in the last year? Bear through you, Mr. Through you, Mr. Chair. To, uh, to Mayor Davis, uh, golf had a surplus last year of $225,000. Right. So, uh, well, I guess we'll come to it in the capital because you, there are certain capital items related to golf and they would be paid from the reserve. Is that my understanding? Through you, Mr. Chair, to Mayor Davis, that's correct. Okay. All right. Well, I'll save my questions till we get to the capital. Okay. No, Councillor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you. I'd like to come back to how we're losing money on beer and sandwiches. Um, Jeff, would you happen to have the revenue and expense number for that line for 2024? For you, Mr. Chair, to Councilor McCurry, we don't have this just yet. Uh, finance staff is preparing our year end. Uh, so for 2024, we... Jeff. For oh, the for 2020? Yes. Your expense and your income for line 145, 104. Income for 2024 is 422,500, uh, and the expense is 430,108. 
Um, may I suggest that you just make those numbers work and show at least a break even? Uh, it, it would seem that um, we could work towards breaking even on that rather than planning to lose money. Through you, Mr. Chair to Councilor McCurry, I agree. We can so definitely make it work. You could revise that. Um, you know, there's two ways to do it. You either increase your revenue or you reduce your cost, and you have control over both. Through you, Mr. Chair to Councilor McCurry, yes, I agree. Thank you. Any other speakers to golf? Seeing none, we'll move on to Park Services 16. Mayor Davis, are you ready for that one? Yes, I am. Go ahead. All right, so we have in this budget, the proposal is to increase at 14% next year, which is one of the larger increases. So yes, I think there, there are certainly a number of questions about this budget. So I'm gonna start with the strategic budget investments for 2024, and there are a number of them totaling hmm, around $300,000. So I would like an explanation for each one of those and in, and why it is that, that if, they, if they're necessary, why, why 2024, why not 2025? That's my first question. Through the chair to the mayor, <clears throat> um, count, uh, council has uh, identified that there are some uh, service level requirements that we're anticipating to meet in our parks team. And one of the main focuses of our work over the last two years as a team has been to reevaluate how we're approaching the business unit. We've identified that our forestry services uh, is one area where we need to invest and have needed to invest for a while. We were also losing uh, contracted capacity that previously we were supported for through our work with Grand Bridge Energy. So what you're seeing in the contracted cyclical grid pruning strategic business um, initiative is a opportunity to implement a contracted forestry team that will approach a systematic, approach the, the city systematically and go th down our rights of way and establish uh, the right clearances and address um, address areas in a systematic way. This is not something that we've had in the past, but it has been recommended in a number of operational reviews and studies. And we are identifying that this is something that we need to start now in order to avoid being so reactive as we have been for the last number of years. The stump grinding is one that we're also falling behind on in terms of the, uh, the the delay between when a tree is removed and when the stump is uh, is addressed. And so this opportunity to invest in the equipment and the staff team, uh, the contracted staff team to address the stump grinding backlog and catch up and reduce that backlog is what you're seeing in that strategic business, business initiative. <clears throat> Parks and Recreation Technical Staffing, one is uh, to augment uh, an existing position to take it to the level of, uh, of rate of pay. It currently is funded at an intern level, and we're finding that uh, the task and the skill set that we need for that position is uh, not going to be supported by the current uh, complement. Um, so we've, we've, we're planning to upgrade that position uh, to a, a full-on technical position with an increment of $20,000 over the existing staff allocation for that position. And we've also identified operationally, and, and Rory can speak to this more directly, but uh, the parks weekend and evening staffing requirements, uh, we, we've identified a weakness in our operation of being able to provide the appropriate coverage to respond to our parks uh, system needs and our parks users needs in the evenings and weekends, particularly from a supervision point of view. So those are the four um, the four strategic business and business initiatives that you're seeing in 2024. These are items that we've identified over the last couple of years as being accumulated needs, and we would have pushed them out further if it was appropriate to respond to the circumstances. We feel that we need to uh, invest in these right, right now in order to meet the level of service expectations from our residents. And in future years, we'll be able to, to question 
the additions or the additional strategic investments in years after 2024, but you've listed a number of them here. And one of you just uh, take us through briefly the justification for those that are in 2025, 2026, 2027. There's quite a few of them. I'm going to let the manager speak to the individual ones. Just start with cemeteries, staff, staffing resources, 2026. Through the chair, um, Mike Westwood, manager of cemeteries for uh, horticulture and forestry, uh, to the mayor. Um, with the, um, like each year as we do additional interments, there's associated maintenance um, that is um, associated with those interments. Um, we see additional um, maintenance of, around monuments um, of uh, the actual plots. Um, and we are in a position currently where um, we're struggling to do the basic uh, landscape maintenance portion of the uh, cemetery's maintenance, which is pr primarily undertaken by students and seasonals. Um, so we're talking about the garbage pickup, the string trimming around the monuments, as well as uh, push mowing, uh, those types of things. Um, we are also anticipating uh, with the cemetery master plan, um, the next phased development of Oak Hill. So you'll see, uh, or we're planning to see an additional section or sections added to the um, to Oak Hill Cemetery, which would require, you know, additional maintenance uh, staff for an, for us to maintain um, those areas. Um, with that, Mr. Mayor, you've gone over your time, your your second speaking opportunity. So, uh, Councillor Hunt. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and through you to uh, to Rick. Um, I want to just look specifically at parks vandalism. So if I understand correctly, so this year's budget was 148,247. And yet for some reason, we're looking at a decrease of 32% in 2024 to 100,450, but then we're, and then we're, and then we're jumping back up to, I'm sorry, the font is very small here. $165,000 in 2025 and then increasing from there. Or, I mean, this is this, this is an unfortunate cost that we have to bear anyway. Parks vandalism, but I'm just wondering why we why we think we're getting a $48,000 break in 2024, um, hope, which hopefully we do. We'd like to not spend any money on vandalism. Um, but then we're, but then we're, projecting that it's going to go right back up again after that. Rory, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah, no problem. Uh, good evening, everyone. Rory Doucette, Manager of Parks Operations. Uh, through you, Chair, to Councillor Hunt. Um, so that through, <clears throat> excuse me, and some of that money for the funding in 2023 uh, was a shifting of our uh, staffing out of Dufferin uh, while it was under construction. So with Dufferin coming back online, that staffing is going to be reallocated back into staffing Dufferin Park. Uh, and that was the reduction in the vandalism piece. Um, and then we were going to recapture um, the the work that that crew was doing with, with some of the staffing we have now, just a few reorgs and some efficiencies we can find internally. Um, but that's why in 2025, we had the staffing increase. So you saw a reduction as our staff shifted back to Dufferin, and then you're going to see it increase again um, as we start formalizing a crew. Um, I believe we were looking for a few student staff uh, to assist us in the summer months where vandalism seems to peak. Uh, to start handling, you know, our trails and our signage, and, and just as we all know, the the graffiti and everything that that happens there. So, so this budget line is primarily a staff-driven line versus our our actual cost to remediate vandalism. Is that what I'm understanding? Through, through you. In the past, yes, it's been mostly a cost for contracted services and damage repair. In 2023, we were able to put some staff into that, uh, reallocated from Dufferin. Uh, we are needing to build that capacity back, but in the meantime, we have to 
obviously roll out Dufferin Park as it opens in 2024. So uh, we're converting, we're over the over the four-year budget, you're moving from a more or less exclusively contracted and, and uh, parts and supplies to that plus some staff time by the end of the four-year multi-year budget. Okay, so the, the, the only real reason for the decrease in 2024 is that Dufferin is not on stream. It's not on stream in 2023, and we need we, we could we need to just smooth out the the rebuild by putting that back. We experimented this year by having that team uh, in 2023. We we were able to uh, experiment with the value of that program. It definitely just um, demonstrated its worth, and uh, we just couldn't do everything all at once. And so we're stepping back into Dufferin in 2024, and then in 2025, looking to add the complement uh, addressing vandalism. Okay, I, I appreciate that. I just I just want people to realize that we are looking at significant costs for vandalism in parks. Uh, I know um, not just JC Park, but we've had some just community parks, uh, especially in Ward Four, um, that you know that this this is a real cost to uh, to the taxpayer um, for the for the cost of vandalism in our parks. So thanks for that, Rick. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to staff. Um, I know that we we were battling uh, lack of staffing with regards to um, tree trimming and cutting back, and there's been umpteen complaints coming through. Have we allocated that in this where we're going to actually start being able to get caught up on the, the delinquent servicing of our trees? Mike, can you speak to that? Through the chair um, to Councillor Sullivan, um, this is the intent of the contracted grid pruning program. Um, most municipalities incorporate a proactive um, component, which is the grid pruning, which allows us to systematically sort of go through neighborhoods um, and inspect and do the required or prescribed work to each individual trees. Um, this is a proactive um, sort of approach. Um, our current um, service is based solely on reactive or reactivity. Um, so, you know, it's a call from a resident or a request from, from a resident or an internal department, um, and then we're responding, um, having to do the work order. Um, we're probably in the neighborhood of 1600 service requests behind which probably equates to equates to over a year um, the intent of the program the the grid pruning program would allow us to identify at first those areas that um, are at a stage of growth um, that um, you know work is required um, and would be done to sort of alleviate the pressure um, on the reactivity or the, you know, the call response side of the program. So your best guess on getting caught up on everything that we're behind the 1600 calls you were saying, and with new calls coming in, when do you figure we would actually, as it, with, according to this budget, get caught up? Your best guess. Through the chair to the counselor, I'm guessing within a, a year and a half, I'm thinking that we would be able to um, go through those um, areas that have a high call volume um, and um, reduce the number of work orders that are in the queue um, because there are existing work orders in those areas um, and also um, sort of preventing the associated calls that occur when our crews currently go into an area where, um, you know, they're doing the tree that the resident called about, but, you know, the neighbor's trees are in the same state, um, but we are unable to do those trees because we're trying to go through um, and do it in a sort of um, call response and in the queue or with the queue in mind. Okay, thank you. Councillor McCurry. Thank you, Chair, and through you to staff. Um, further to the um, the tree questions, uh, Mike, are we using uh, contracted services currently for uh, tree maintenance other than stumping? 
through the chair to Councillor McCurry. We do use contracted uh, tree maintenance um, contractors, but on very specific jobs. So, you know, that might be that uh, it, it makes more sense to have a contractor do it because they're better equipped. Um, they have a larger crew. They have um, the time yeah. to, to respond in a more timely manner given our workload. Um, there's a number of considerations. Yeah. So, so Mike, who, who supervises that work? Uh, the supervisor of forestry and horticulture. Is he not also supervising his own crews? Through the chair to the councillor. Yes, they're responsible for overseeing both the contracted services as well as the internal crews. Uh, our experience previously when we contracted with a company whose name I will not mention on TV because I don't need to incur additional costs for the city of Bradford. Um, we we did not get good service from them. Uh, you know, in some cases they'd arrive at 8.30, take them an hour to set up, then it's coffee time and maybe work for an hour before lunch and then come back and set up again and might get three or four hours of work out of them in a day. And, and we weren't able to control the, the uh, monetary or the... Um, the outcome of, of that work. Um, and I'm just wondering why, why we're looking at uh, going back in that direction when our experience was uh, very poor and the numbers seem to just grow as we go on year by year. Um, I'd, I'd like to see us revisit this and talk about bringing on more resources and staff of our own folks, our own forces to do this work uh, in a way that you can ensure is going to be done safely and efficiently and at a lower cost, Mike. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on that, please. I think that we've considered, um, you know, adding uh, additional full-time staff as well as the equipment that would be required to undertake um, or deploy additional crews. Uh, in this case, we feel that the um, contracted service is the preferred option given um, the ability for them to mobilize uh, with the existing equipment um, and the nature of the work that we're asking them to do. Um, I do believe that, you know, it's, it's, you know, contracted services require oversight. And I believe that we have the team in place um, to ensure that um, the contracted services um, deliver on what's expected. Okay. Uh, our guys are working five days a week now, 8.30 to 4.30? Uh, 7 till 3. Okay. Uh, I'd like to see you investigate the opportunity to bring on a weekend crew that could, you know, increase our productivity by, what, a quarter maybe. I wonder if you could take a look at that and, and provide us with a memo about um, whether or not that might be a thing to do to increase our capacity. Um, now, secondly, stump grinding. Um I'll ask you the same question, why we're relying on contractors rather than bringing that in-house. Uh, through the through the chair to the councillor. Um, again, I feel that um, the provision of stump grinding um, through the contractor is, um, we're gonna get more bang for our buck. Um, I think in our private conversation uh, recently, I. I had advised you that um, um, we've had a lot of success recently uh, with our contractor. We've really uh, zeroed in on um, ensuring that they meet our expectations. The number of complaints have drastically reduced and we've seen uh, the number of inches increase um, 8% last year and about 35% the year before. So um, we're seeing improvements and efficiencies um, through the way we administer the stumping contract. And uh, in my opinion, uh, we're gonna get more bang for the taxpayer dollar if we uh, utilize contracted services versus bringing it in-house. Um, the challenge with bringing it in-house is that it's quite administratively onerous. And I don't think that we currently have the staffing complement that would be able to um, effectively um, oversee that. Yeah, thank you for your, that. And, and time's little, up, Councillor McCurry. Time flies, doesn't it? It does, it, it does. does. Councillor Slice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and through you to Mike. Mike, uh, thanks and congratulations for getting all the paving done on the road network in uh, Mount Hope Cemetery. It, it looks like it's 
pretty well completed, unless over in the older sections. Are, are you still working through that, or is is that a completed project? Through the count or through the chair to Councillor Sless, um, we have completed most of the um, roadway improvements at Mount Hope. There is there are um, small sections uh, in the older sections that remain um, to be paved. Um, we are in the process of uh, confirming what, um, like the the amount of paving that is left to do and uh, whether or not we would have the budget in the capital project to uh, complete that. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I go to back to second time speakers, the contracted uh, trimming and removal, is it the same contractor that was used by the city years ago? To the chair, um, the contracted services that we use for tree maintenance, tree removal, uh, we use a number of contractors. Currently, we don't use one uh, particular contractor. We sort of uh, adhere to the finance policy, uh, purchasing policy, um, and uh, get the required quotes typically for each job. Okay, thank you. Councillor McCurry. Uh, sure, thank you. And now for the most difficult question of the evening, I'm sure um, budget drivers, which used to be called unmet needs. Last category, other, what's in it? Other. Through the chair, the uh, the small amount of uh, $12,000, $556 that is reflected in the four-year uh, budget of re reflecting other is related to very small um, un um, budget implications related to training, related to uh, expense uh, expenses in various areas. It's not a it's not a strategic budget investment. Other is not a strategic budget investment. It's a a category that's didn't didn't uh, captured all of the budget implications that weren't captured in labor or contracted supplies. It's a very small number over the four years in this particular budget. Maybe we're talking about a different thing. It's seventy five thousand seven ninety seven, Rick. Um, which page are you looking at? Sorry. Uh, one twenty eight. It's the very bottom of budget drivers. Sorry, no, okay, I misspoke. It wasn't unmet needs, which has a new name. It was budget drivers. Give me a minute while I look up that particular one. No need. You can you can send us a memo. Thank you. Gus Carpenter. Thank you. In the operating impact from capital and lawn bowling at Walter Gretzky for 2025, $320,000 in, in operating expenses. Is that an annual expense that we're expecting? Through the chair, that is the for starting in 2025 and would be for the, the, the three years of the remaining of the multi-year budget oh, oh three that all covers the full three years and we're expecting revenue as well right there would be a minor uh, a small membership component and some revenue associated with the lawn bowling program yes that's correct so when the and, and then when you talk about the catherine but new ball diamond at catherine a yard uh, congratulations on that i appreciate that it's needed over there uh that that 3900 is also for four years then right that's correct. The, the Catherine Yard uh, operating impact from capital, we're not anticipating the the ball diamond to be completed until well into the multi-year budget. And what you're seeing there is the annual maintenance increment that will be required in order to maintain an additional ball, ball field. Once it's there. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mary Davis. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And similar to what Councillor Carpenter was Looking at the Southwest Community Park maintenance for 2025, 319,872. That's a one year. That's for one year, or is that over three years? So that's the that's once it starts, and then for the remainder of the budget, that's a cumulative figure. So uh, we're looking at the park maintenance bid beginning in 2025 and continuing through 26 and 27. So it'll be about 110,000 a year. I'm not sure of the specific breakdown, but I can look that. Just divide it by three. So, and the splash pad seasonal staff and operating expenses, 
So that's the additional cost over three years of how many splash pads, how many additional splash pads? Rory, can you speak to that one? Uh, yes, um, through the chair to Mayor Davis. Um, so that, that staffing complement is, is to, to meet the norm that was put forward to uh, develop a plan and start factoring um, additional splash pads. I believe there were 17 in total spread over 10 years. Uh, in the capital side of things. So this is just starting to capture that. And, and currently our staffing right now, we don't have splash pad staffing. There is a requirement to do daily inspections uh, for uh, health purposes. Um, so we, we've had staff that are, are doing our trails, that are doing our splash pads, that are doing our bike park. So um, again, not trying to like just prioritizing in, in each year for the staffing I, I feel we need. Uh, the splash pad uh, additional staffing will we'll start taking on our splash pads and meeting our daily inspections to free up our Sorry, yeah, three splash pads over the next four years uh, forecasted uh, in this budget here. So as we're going to the current uh, splash pads that we have now. Yeah, so for informational purposes, what's the additional, what's the cost of maintaining uh, staffing one splash pad per year? Uh, I don't have the numbers actually at hand for, for one splash pad per year, but I can get that to you. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate if you would. Yep. Uh, just just an observation, Mr. Chair, that, you know, we hear many times that with uh, growth, there are costs that we incur that are more than just simply taking two or three percent onto our cost from last year. And I think this is an exact excellent example of that. Uh, growth has uh, driven the demand for the Southwest Community Park, which is going to be built out the next year or two. And you're seeing the cost of, there is a cost that comes with that, and that's the cost to maintain and operate the park facility. And that's that's fine, it's needed, but it's a, it is a clear demonstration of the impact that uh, growth has and why it's essential that we have assessment growth that uh, picks up these kinds of costs that are, that come to us and that we incur because of growth. So it's a, it's a really neat little example of uh, the impact of that. Thank you, Councillor Sluss. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Rick. Rick, when can the public expect to be lawn bowling at Gretzky's? Uh, our friends in the design and construction group are working on the uh, finalizing the design right now. We're expecting construction this year uh, to start this year, and we're hopeful that it'll be ready for uh, lawn bowling in 2025. It'll take a year, will it, to put the the greens in? It will take a it will take a full year to not only construct the place that where it can happen, but also allow the turf to get to the point where it's usable. Yes. Okay. And and does that budget include the uh, the screening of the Quonset building at the entrance to the uh, the complex? That's a separate project uh, in the capital program, which uh, we can discuss when it gets to the oh. that part of the budget. But the people going lawn bowling will see a new a new uh, fence there. Would I be? When I when, when the head bobbing. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing none, that brings us to the end of the operating budget. So I would suggest this would be a good time for us to recess and we'll come back Wednesday and start on the Capitol. Unless there's a burning desire to jump into Capitol. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, we have uh, 9D uh, climate and environmental impacts uh, as an amendment to the main motion. Can I get a mover and a seconder for that? Councillor Sullivan, Councillor Carpenter. Questions, comments? Seeing none, we'll call the question. The amendment carries on our recorded vote of uh, 11 to 0. Those voting in favor, Mayor Davis, Councillor Zicolis, Sullivan, Caputo, Celeste, Martin, McCrary, Carpenter, Hunt, Samuel, Bentelbord.
With that, we are recessed until the 17th. Thank you, everyone.